podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, June 26th, 2021. This is episode 1808. Enjoy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. See, see, nothing's changed, Damon. <laughs> Professor Laura has the uh, week off, our musical director, my longtime musical director, who's back from his well, he's disappeared, but I'm glad he. I'm glad he's back. Uh, it's great to have uh, Damien uh, on the show today, and expect some fun music. He's always been. Uh, he's always been good at that. This is a show where we talk about uh, you know technology, and if you want to talk with me about technology, I would love to hear from you. Here's the deal: phone number is eight 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 ask Leo. Now that's a toll free number eight 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 two seven five five three six. Uh, we spent the money to make it toll-free in the U.S. and Canada, but uh, we didn't make it internationally toll-free. That's expensive. So instead, use Skype or something like that to call, and it should still cost you nothing. Uh, 8888-ASK-LEO. There's a website if you want to uh, follow along without writing anything down. That's the best part of the website. TechGuyLabs.com. We've got uh, James DeRuvo. Writing it all down, our official scribe. Site is free, no charge, no sign up, just wander in. Techguylabs.com. So if you hear something and uh, and you and you know you want to write it down, don't worry, you don't have to. It'll be there. Also audio and video from the show after the fact. Do you have a Western Digital My Book Live? Uh, it's kind of a storage device, uh, it really a network attached storage is uh, what it's called. Um, I know a lot of you do. It's a very popular device. It was sold in the big box stores and so forth, so a lot of people got it as a kind of either an external hard drive or a backup device or a network backup device. Disconnect it from the Internet right now. <laughs> if you, <laughs> and you might, you might want to check to see if it's okay a Western Digital is recommending that you unplug MyBook Live storage devices from the internet until further notice. While they try to figure out what the heck's going on, users are reporting their data on these devices completely erased. Completely erased. Western Digital says, we weren't hacked. So... Maybe, it, I think, you know, probably likely there's something, a bug in the software that allows a bad guy who sees one of these devices on a network to go in and erase it entirely. Uh, this first came to light on the Western Digital Forums where users reported that the data loss coincided with a factory reset that was performed on their device. One person posted a log that said, factory reset, shutting down for reboot. And boom, gone. Uh, wow. Wow. So uh, it has, you know, I mean, it's, I had one of them. They stopped supporting it about six years ago. But, um, and apparently stopped updating it some time ago as well. They are being wiped clean. Unplug it if you haven't already uh, experienced this. My Book Live and My Book Live Duo from Western Digital. It's a, it's a bug. You know, it might, it might be a bug that is Western Digital's fault. It might be a malefactor, a bad guy, a hacker. Um, it's hard to There's no ransom notes. There's no other threats. I wouldn't rule out a, a flaw in the software at this point. Western Digital, uh, talking to a bleeping computer, said they're investigating the attacks, but they don't think it was a compromise of their servers. The MyBook Live device received its final update in 2015, so it's a pretty old device. <laughs> uh, 
we are currently investigating, says Western Digital. We'll provide updates to this when they're available. Well, mm. uh, by the way, since the last update in 2015, there was, in fact, a remote code execution vulnerability disclosed. Uh, whoops. And it was never fixed. CVE 2018, so it's three years later, 18472. And apparently nobody did anything with it until just now. So what have we learned here? <laughs> well, first of all, how important it is that uh, devices continue to be updated for security. This was a security flaw discovered three years ago that was never fixed by Western Digital. Uh, not good. You might you might hold that against Western Digital. I think you'd you'd have every right to. You'd also um, underscores you know when you buy something you want to make sure that it's being kept up to date that it's from a reliable responsible company and when it goes out of service maybe start thinking about replacing it. There's another important lesson though a pretty important lesson which is I know this is a backup device and I think people go well my data is backed up on this backup device and then they don't worry about the originals or they erase the originals they only have one copy on this backup device well it's a backup see it's backed up it says backup right on it but one copy of anything i don't care where it is is not a backup one copy of anything is a recipe for disaster if you've got stuff that you've made that you've created that you haven't backed up that you don't have multiple copies of do it now because these things happen. Uh, I've mentioned this many, many times. I'll, I'll mention it again. And credit to my friend Peter Krogh, who is a photographer. You know, photographers take about, care about this stuff a lot. They really care about this stuff a lot. They, um, you know, well, imagine, you know, if you're a, you're for photographing a wedding or a lo another life event and you lose the pictures, they're not going to stage it again for you. That baby's not going to be born a second time. The wedding's not going to happen again. Maybe you get the bride and groom to come pose for pictures. Good luck. <laughs> it's not going to be a fun conversation. So Peter uh, pays a lot of attention to backup. Uh, in fact, he has a really good site that he did with the Library of Congress um, some years ago, but it's still good. And his backup strategy is there, along with other uh, really excellent information for photographers uh, it's from the American Society of Media Photographers. It's dpbestflow.org. Best flow as in best workflow. dpbestworkflow.org. And it's really about best workflow practices. But, of course, among those best workflow practices are backup. And he coined the idea, the term which I've repeated many, many times, of 3 to one backup. Because it's easy to remember. Three copies of anything. Not one, that's not a backup. Two even is a little sketch. Three, ideally on two different media. You know, maybe a Western Digital My Book Live was one of them, but another one might be cloud storage or it might be a CD somewhere. You know, two different kinds of mediums. So you're not reliable relying on one particular thing. This is a good case for that. And and finally, the third uh, part of three, two, one, one copy should be in the cloud up in the sky, or off-site, actually really technically off-site. Uh, I say in the cloud because that's off-site, uh, you know, on the internet, whether it's, you know, a backup service or uh, Apple's iCloud or Microsoft's OneDrive or Dropbox. Those are all cloud services that store your data. One of the three copies should be in the cloud. And that's, you know, if the worst happens and, you know, the house falls in on itself or something. Three, two, one. So people who did that, you know, your my book live goes south. Okay, but I have another copy somewhere. I would get rid of that my book live. It's out of date, and there are exploits. And you know, you if really, honestly, this is hard to believe. You might be lucky that all they did was delete the data. With this vulnerability, they could have done other things, including, and maybe they did. We don't know yet. Exfiltrate, download all of the data on your drive, and maybe you're going to get an email at some point saying, hey, I have your data, the data you just lost. Would you like it back? Would you like it back? And if you would, just send me, a, you know, one or two Bitcoins. That'll, that'll do. That'll do me fine. You know, I'm waiting for that other shoe to drop.
three, two, one backup, you just go, no. <laughs> but I wouldn't use that Western Digital anymore. It's not been patched for years. Holy cow. What a terrible thing. And if it happened to you, I'm very, very sorry. Microsoft announced Windows 11. We knew they would on a Thursday. And uh, there's been some consternation uh, amongst people. You know, it's funny because inevitably when, when there's something like this, a lot of people are going to say, oh, I can't wait to get it. But a lot of people are going to say, oh, I hate it. How long can, do I have before I have to get it? I don't want it. But the biggest noise this time, which it's kind of funny, is from people who say, I can't get it. I want it. Microsoft announced uh, that it's not going to run a lot of older machines, maybe machines not even that much older, maybe a couple of years old, because it's going to require a secure uh, hardware device called TPM. Uh, a lot of computers don't have that, especially gaming computers or hobbyist, you know, home-built computers. And it also is not going to work with uh, a variety of Intel chips, including the i7-7000, which is fairly recent so there's a lot of noise now i wouldn't panic yet uh, first of all uh it's not going to come out till later this year it's really going to be for new computers that's really i think the point of this but a lot of upset and i'm sure we'll be talking more about this not only today but for the weeks to come windows 11 uh, will be available later this month for what, what they call insiders people who sign up for the microsoft windows insiders program which you anybody can do many do millions do chance to try new software before it's official and before it's finalized so you should be able to get it we think maybe even as early as a tuesday monday or tuesday uh as a windows insider but uh the rest of the world won't be getting it till this fall or maybe even early 2022 windows 11 nothing much new under the hood it's all uh, it's all cosmetic it's all pre it's pretty pretty not knocking it but uh, watch, because there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of people going, wait a minute. Hey, I can't run it. I didn't want it, but now I really do. Right? That's really what it is. I didn't want it, but I do want it now because you won't give it to me. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will take your calls. 8888-ASK-LEO. Damon, push that button. Damien, we got to go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that one doesn't fire automatically, Damien. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls. Your calls right after this. There she is. Kim Schaffer, the phone angel. You call on her. Unbreakable. Hello, Kimmy. Oh, wait a minute. Let me turn on your mic. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. You've got one. Good I have one. You. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Good to see you, too. Happy, um, what day is this? Anything special? A, um, End of June? Saturday, the 26th. Yeah. The days, believe it or not, are getting shorter. The nights are getting longer. We've we've crossed that virtual horizon. I did come from somewhere that it didn't get dark till 10 o'clock at night. Oh, that was so kind of nice. weird. Where was that? Up in the Pacific nor Northwest. Oh, yeah, where the nurse go. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It's weird, but it's cool. Sunset yeah. was at 9.15, but it was still dark at 10. <laughs> How was your trip? Did you have fun? It was a lot of fun, yeah. Good. Yeah, I took the heat up there, and uh, I left it, because apparently it's going to be 109 in Seattle on Yikes. Monday, which is kind of unprecedented. They don't know what to do. They don't. They're they don't have snow plows right or anything. They're they're <laughs> completely without any... I don't think they need a snow plow for no. 109 degree no, heat, but yeah. they do need air conditioning. Air AC, nothing. They're not ready. Wow. Wow. No, they're not. And it was 91 when I got dropped Yikes. off at the airport last night. So Yikes. it's it's already getting there. What but a, beautiful, nonetheless. What a weird world. Who should I start with? Let's. Here? Well, you've been talking backup, so I don't know. Let's continue with the theme with Dave in Redland, California. Like Why one. not? <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Hello, Dave. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. I really enjoy your show. Oh, thank you for calling. I appreciate it. So um, I, I do have a, a question, kind of two questions about backup. So I, I've taken your advice for years, and I have um, a cloud backup. And Good. I kind of have built-in backups because I have uh, an external hard drive on my, my home desktop, my laptop, and my work desktop. So my, my question is, obviously, with iDrive, it, it all gets you know uploaded. But I've been a little behind on updating my other two. I use my laptop mostly for my, you know, everyday use. But I want to make sure that I get uh, 
the files, mostly audio, and I've, I've spent the last couple of years putting, you know, 3,000 CDs. Um, and, Holy like, mole! How many yeah, gigabytes so have, of music is that? It's uh, almost three. Okay. That's, so, you know, uh, that's the nice thing about music. Three gigabytes would be a couple of high-def movies, but it's thousands, right. hundreds of thousands of songs, so that's good. Right. Yeah. And then I've also I've also digitized all of my DVDs, um, so totally, you know, it's almost five gigs between music and, because and, it's not HD, it's just regular, you know, but I like having, you know, my own kind of Netflix on my Apple TV. Yeah. Um, so how much, there. how big is your storage? Um, I, I have an eight gig. Um, oh, that's not too bad. Uh, yeah. Do you mean gigs so, or terabytes? Oh, I'm sorry, terabytes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry, terabytes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Uh, yeah, yeah. There's two kinds of. There's actually three kinds of backup you should be aware of. There's the image backup, which we sometimes do. I don't. It's not widely used, but when you image a drive, you're kind of freeze drying it with everything, operating system and everything, and that's really mostly used for quick restore. And generally, it's not something I would upload, but just I would keep an. Im for instance, when you first install Windows and then make an image and then you so now you've got an image that's faster than an installer, you just blast it back on and then do the updates install the stuff you want, then make another image. That's the one you're going to use usually. But then, of course, it's out of date the minute you change it. So the next step right. is a regular backup, which will back up just your data, not Windows or anything else. That's the second kind of backup. And generally, that's done in a big... Yeah, that's done in a big blob. And then there's something, a third thing called incremental backup. When you back up a file, there's an archive bit on the file. It, it's hidden, but it's something the operating system could say can see. Historically, Windows used that. I think a lot of software doesn't use that anymore to say this has been archived. It's been backed up. You don't you don't have to worry about it anymore. We've got a copy. Uh, in, in effect, that's what incremental backup is doing. It's looking and saying, has this been fully backed up? Is this completely backed up? Yes, I'm going to ignore it. I'm only going to back up the changes, hence the name incremental. And so the idea in general is to run a regular full backup and maybe weekly, monthly, depending on, you know, how much data you have. You have so much, you probably don't need to do that. Uh, and then periodically, I would say daily, at least run an incremental backup, which will only back up changes. And then the restore involves getting the full backup restored and then adding the changes that came in the incremental backup. So have something that's doing it daily, at least. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The problem, you know, the, the thing to keep in mind is if my data were to die right now, if I had a, all my data on a Western Digital My Book Live and, it, and I woke up and it were gone... How much would I completely lose? And what you would lose is whatever that happened between the last incremental backup and today. So if you back up daily, it'll never be more than a day. If you back up weekly, it could be as much as six days. If you back up monthly, it could be almost all of the month's changes. So that's why I, I recommend at least a daily incremental backup. And incremental backups are quick because you don't do that much in a day. Even if you, right. you know, rip four CDs, that's not going to be, you know, it's going to be a few hundred megabytes. It's going to go pretty quick. This becomes much more important with cloud backup because cloud backup is being, is very slow. You know, this is the thing, and we don't mention this in the iDrive thing, but it's true of all cloud backup because they don't want to satch. First of all, they're using your upstream bandwidth, which is always lower than your downstream, right? So if you have a hundred megabytes, a hundred megabits down and five up, it, can, it at most it could only use five megabits up, but it won't use all of it because it can't. If it did, it would choke your internet connection. So right. it generally uses less than half, uh, which means two and a half megabits up, which means it's going to take forever. Sometimes people say, "Well, I have a hundred terabytes and I want to back it up at the cloud." It's going to take years. For, <laughs> right, right? right. So you have to be judicious with cloud backup. Because you, you, you're really only going to back up the stuff you really care about. Now, once that initial seed, they call it a seed when it's a cloud backup. Once the, That's the full backup. Once that's done, and that's the slowest thing, and that might take weeks or even months. But once that's done, then it always only does incremental to update it. Got it. So, so, and something like iDrive should be automatically doing incremental. In fact, a lot of backups like iDrive just watch to see if, you know, the file system did something change. Okay, let's back it up. 
Yeah, I get that daily um, from iDrive. It's the other. It's the the the, the local. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the local backup. Yeah. That. Um, so is is there a program um, that that I can set for incremental? Uh, yeah, there's so, so this is this gets really complicated. So you're going to do inc you want to do local backup. Um, in I would suggest a synchronization program. So is the backup media always online? Uh, no. No. So there's a program. Are you on Windows? Uh, Mac. Mac. Um, I would I use a free program, uh, open source, a little finicky not finicky but tricky to use it's very reliable called sync thing s-y-n-c-t-h-i-n-g but it takes some attention to setting it up sync thing runs on all my devices you can also run it on network attached storage it won't run on a, just a usb drive you need an operating system to run it but what it'll do is it'll look at folders that you want to keep copied uh, copies of and, and it can be you know giant amounts and it will keep them in sync when you're doing this for backup, there's a setting in sync thing that says only uh, don't download changes. F f let's see, you you, on the, you you put on the receiving end. Don't don't basically you don't want to sync deletions, and this is true of any synchronization program. If I delete it on my locally, I don't want you to delete it on the synchronization uh, because that would not be a backup. Then that would be like, like Dropbox keeping them identical and you don't want them to be identical. You want them to save everything and never delete anything. So that's why it's a little tricky. There's a program. If you're using a Mac and you're just periodically plugging in this external drive, I think the best uh, tool for that is super duper, which okay. is from shirt pocket software. Super duper can be, you can set it up to back up on a schedule, but you can also set it up that when I plug in this drive, back do an incremental backup or do a full backup. Uh, there's a free version. You can also pay for it. It's worth paying for. It's not very expensive. On the Mac, super duper. On Windows, I like a program called Second Copy. Same idea. When I plug in the drive, back it up. Got to run because it's time for the hipster. <laughs> It's time for our home theater guru, Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek, contributor at techhive.com, and our resident hip gentleman. Hello, Scotty. Hey, Leo. How you doing? What's up? What's new in your world? Well, <clears throat> quite a bit, as always. Um, I thought I would answer a listener question today. Sure. Uh, a fellow by the name of Shivan Bassaw. Uh, said he bought a new TV, an LG 65 Nano 91, one of the good LG LCD TVs with uh, uh, full array local dimming. The Nano refers to mini LEDs, maybe? Well, or? No, no, it refers to a, a technology they're using, uh, which are nanotubes. You've heard of nanotubes. Yeah. They, they, they use it to actually increase the viewing angle which is a difficult thing to do. Oh, in LCD. interesting. So that's really good. Yeah. And to improve the contrast. Uh, so the lower nanos don't have full array local dimming, so I don't recommend them, but this one does. So, so good on you, Siobhan, that's great. Really likes the picture quality, so I'm glad of that. Uh, and he's considering purchasing some sort of bias lighting. Now we've talked about bias lighting before, and what it is, is you, you put a little light behind the TV uh, because if you watch in a dark room, you can, you can suffer eye fatigue after a while because the TV is so bright and the rest of the environment is so dark that your eyes have to work kind of hard. And so what a bias light does is it actually biases your vision system so that it's more comfortable in the range of the light coming out of the TV. Uh, so he says, do I have a particular brand and model I'd like to rec you'd like to recommend? Do you even recommend bias lighting or is it overkill for a living room? And the answer is there's no need for it in a living room unless you watch with all the lights out. 
And if it's not a super big room, well, I guess, you know, you're looking at the TV, so. Yeah, yeah, you're looking at the TV. Yeah. Uh, But if you're in a living room, when when someone says living room, I I think. Bigger room. The lights, bigger room and the lights are on. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe somebody's, some kids are playing in the corner. Somebody's sewing over here. So. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a living room. I got a spinning wheel in mine. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm spinning. Exactly. Uh, I'm spinning the linen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, no, but if you're if you're in a really dark room, I recommend it. If you're in a brighter lit room, there's no reason for it. The bias lighting it looks cool, but is it uh, is there a reason to have it? F- you know, because it's you know kind of your TV glows from behind. Well, yeah. As I said, the if you're watching a TV, emits a lot of light. Yeah. And it typically doesn't fill your field oh, of yeah. view. Mom always said, "Don't watch TV in a dark room." Mm-hmm. Mom always said and, that. Was well, she? She was right. Actually, I think she was right, in a sense. It's not dangerous. Just turn it on just a becomes, light if you're going to watch the TV. <laughs> well, better still, <laughs> better still is to have a bias light, which is a specific type of light that goes behind the TV. And these days, you can get them in a rope light format you know you've yeah, yeah. heard of rope lights right philips hue a- makes them a lot of companies make them it's kind of cool exactly and the they idea are. is that uh to reduce eye strain it's not that it correct. looks better it's correct. to reduce eye strain correct correct exactly right Interesting. now it, it can make the tv look worse this fellow says while i was looking online i found a, i found this one and it was on amazon it's it's called the Govi Immersion Backlight Ambient Assistant, <laughs> and 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 it's it I don't it also comes with a camera that you stick on the TV and he said and and Siobhan said I'm not sure I really like the idea of a camera on my TV. Well, some cam- TVs already have them, but that's beside the point. This bias light acts like the Philips Ambilight, which is it changes color. With the color of the right. content on the display, right. bad idea. You oh, do really? Not want that's terrible. It's terrible. Oh, why? Be- because it it changes your perception of the color. Oh, yeah. That's why professional graders or photographers yep. will have yep. a thirty percent gray room. <laughs> that's <laughs> they want right. a neutral that's- background color. That's right, and they want a neutral bias light. Interesting. And, and and that's the reason why, and it's really important. And so he said, do you have any to recommend? And I absolutely do. Oh, good. The company that I really like is at BiasLighting.com. Wow. Couldn't be easier. They have a business. They have a business. And uh, this is a, a com- the company is Media Light that, that makes these bias lights, and they are at the right color. You have to, you know, white. How do you define white? Right. You know, it, it can be a creamy white. It can be right. a bluish white. You want it to be a neutral white. And that's what these bias lights are specifically designed to do. These are actually at a particular color temperature. Correct. Correct. At a color temperature, which is known as D65 wow. or 6500K. And that's the clo- that's the equivalent of a 30% gray. It's a neutral w- well, whitish 30- light behind you. Correct. It's a neutral. Is it light. daylight? Now, is that that? Is, no, daylight is actually fifty six hundred. So it's so it's, it's a little, little but, redder, it's a, but a not a lot. Bluer, bluer, a little bluer okay. actually, but okay. not by much. Okay. And it's the it's the same color of white that mastering monitors use when oh, they're really? calibrated. Okay. When they're calibrated, when mastering monitors calibrated, or even a consumer TV, you want the white that it produces to be this sixty five hundred K. No or, kidding. Or D65, exactly. So this so, matches the white of your TV when it's on correct, true white. Okay. Correct. Okay. And that's what's important. Even better, the LX1 bias lighting from this company, Media Light, uh, is ISF certified, and it's half the price of this other one. Oh. <laughs> um, it, you, you can get it in different lengths, these rope lights. So depending on how big your TV is, a three-meter length with a, a, a magic with a Wi-Fi dimmer, and you do want to have a dimmer if you can, is thirty four bucks. This this one on Amazon is eighty bucks. Ah. So I do not recommend the one on Amazon that he was linking to, but I do recommend this LX One Bias Light. Why would you want a light. Wi-Fi dimmer? Well, you you don't need a Wi-Fi dimmer. You could have an IR dimmer, an infrared dimmer. 
uh, if you have a line of sight. Wouldn't you want it just to turn on when the TV turns on and turn you off? You do, you do. But mm. you do want to be able to control the brightness. You want to set the brightness and then leave it alone. Okay. And you want the brightness. So all you really need is the cheap dimmer that you go over, you set that it, you and you do forget it. You do it once and yeah. you forget it. That's it's not correct. something then, you're turning up and down on a regular basis. Correct, correct. You just want to set it to 10% of the TV's peak brightness. So they offer a variety of dimmers at uh, BiasLighting.com. Just get the five dollar button dimmer. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then you're only spending under thirty bucks. Yeah. For a three meter length of light. For, for a sixty five inch TV, how big should you get? Ooh, you know what? I didn't calculate that out. I I figured three meters is probably more than enough. That's nine feet. That's a lot. That's nine, uh, yeah. yeah. You might you might be able to get away with two feet uh, with two meters. Do you put it uh, all around the edge, the yes, back edge of the, the TV? The back edge of the TV, precisely. So you That's just exactly kind of glue, what you glue. Do. Does it have a little sticky tape? You double side. I assume it yeah, does. I hope glue, it does. <laughs> just glue it all the way around. You have to plug it in. Obviously, you've got the dimmer yep. button. You turn yep. it on, and then your TV glows from behind. Correct. Now, actually, if you think about it, if you've got a painted wall or wallpaper, and that could be that's going to change it too, right? Yes, it is. That what you is really correct. need is a sixty-five D sixty-five wall paint, which I have in my home theater. No, I was <laughs> I joking. Do. No, you. Re that's the ideal situation, but I realize it's not realistic for most people. Honey, we're going to paint the living room gray. Yes, dark gray, <laughs> as dark as you can get it. My, my my home theater has 9% reflectivity. That's pretty bad. So it's very low. It's very black. This is interesting. Bioslighting.com. Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek. You'll find his work at techhive.com. And, of course, he joins us every week on the Tech Guy Show. We've never talked about this. Now you've 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 given me a hankering for something I don't have. I think I'm going to have to go out and buy this and paint the room gray. Thank you, Scott. There you go. Well, I... We never even talked about this. I think, I think we probably have, but it's been a long time. Fascinating. Bias lighting. It's it's a it's a it's a little discussed subject, and it's really important. Uh, again, for reducing eye strain if you're watching in a dark room. I wonder if they have a calculator uh, on this site for the size of the TV. Ooh, that that would be really yeah. good, wouldn't it? Yeah. I've actually done some work for for this company. I, uh, I wrote a manual. They also distribute the Spears and Munsell yes, UHD I see that. Yeah. HDR. Yeah, I wrote I wrote the the comprehensive manual for that disc. Uh, so I know oh. these guys. And oh. I will. I so they will, make uh, the Spears and Munsell disc. That's theirs. They don't make it. No, they they distribute it. Oh, okay. Uh, Spears and Munsell make it. Uh, Stacy Spears and Don Munsell. Uh, who are seriously... Incidentally, statistic. they sell it yeah. for computers, too. Mm. So I wonder, maybe if you're... Certainly if you're doing Photoshop or color grading on a computer... Absolutely. Or maybe You'd playing a lot too. of Valheim, you might want to get this. Actually, my computer, my monitor, has a light on the back because it's from Alienware. But I have it cycling, which I probably shouldn't... <laughs> Do. Oh, cycling through different colors? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because it's cool. Just because it's, it's cool. cool. Yes, it's cool. And Philips, when they Philips came out with the Ambi light many years ago yeah. on their TVs, yeah. they thought, oh, this is cool. When it when the when the you have a lot of blue on the back in the image, we'll make the act. Ambi light, backlight, blue, and when you, when you have a lot of red, we'll make it red. Well, it's just distracting. It's it, it changes your perception of the image. So, you really want the bias light to be steady, constant, neutral white, D sixty five white, at ten percent of the peak white of the of the TV, and that will solve the eye strain problem, and won't bother you with you know, flashing colors and it's, it's very distracting from getting you out of the movie or the TV show you're watching. And really you want to be engrossed, engaged, so, right? Yeah. So they have a little, um, on the website, they, under the, uh, under the, the basics, they have, what length ah. should I get for my TV? Oh, very good. And for very a, uh, 70 inch, if you want four sided coverage, mm, which I do recommend then, oh, but if your display's on a stand, you really only need three sided. Well, that's true. Yeah. If it's on a stand, sure. But for four sided coverage, five meters, 
Oh, okay. Uh, four meters for three sided coverage. Yep, yep, you're right. Okay, so you so interesting, but for that's for a seventy inch. inch. But for, for a sixty-five, 50, yeah, you can do a three. less. Yeah, and for for fifty-five, four meters to or three meters. Yeah, for a fifty-five, let's see. John actually measured. <laughs> 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 uh, generally speaking, you should put only put lights only three three sides when you have any of the following obstructions. Hmm. If there's if the TV's on a stand and can't pass below the TV, yeah, or a sound true. bar, center channel speaker, yeah, yeah, distractions like a mess of wires, <laughs> reflections <laughs> if it's on a glass table. Four sides are best when the TV's on a wall mount, but you can't really go wrong with three sides. Hmm. So maybe I'll just get the because I it, it is on a oh no wait a minute I can't do this this is a proje I have a projector never mind <laughs> well now we didn't get into that but this is an interesting question uh, Joe Kane who is one of my gurus in this industry, hold that thought we're gonna take a break can you stay okay. at the top of the hour sure All sure right. be right back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, was talking more with Scott, but in the break he said, you know, even for computers you might want this bias lighting, lighting behind the monitor, especially if you're a photographer or videographer, you're, you you want accurate color reproduction. We, all, You know, a lot of companies uh, offer high-quality displays, P3, broad gamut, even laptops these days. Uh, it sounds like this back lighting might be important even for them. I had never even thought about that. Scott, it's a fascinating subject. 8888 ask Leo that's the phone number next San Diego Joey's on the line hi Joey hey it's your favorite my favorite Joey your favorite guy how you doing Joey I'm doing great man thanks for taking my call and always a pleasure you for us man what can I, what can I do for you today <laughs> I, just, I have a comment Leo okay I'm a, been a mu I've been a music fan for almost 50 years and I think this new Apple system is awesome. So there's two things Apple's doing with their new Apple Music. One is lossless, and that's something Tidal and Deezer and other streaming, premium streaming services have done. Uh, I use a classical service called Prime Phonic that does it. Uh, also, interestingly, Amazon has started doing uh, what they call HD audio, which is lossless, high-res audio. Um, Apple has said, in fact, uh, the, the guy in charge at Apple said very famously, 99% of our audience aren't going to tell the difference between lossless and not lossless. He said, and I think he's right, this is at EQ, he said the big change is spatial, where we go, you know, remember we went from mono to stereo, from a single speaker to two speakers, which opened up the sound, not just having some stuff in the left, some stuff in the right. In fact, you almost always want the singer in the middle. But just kind of making it feel more like you're watching a show where it spreads out a little bit more. And spatial takes it to the next level where it spreads out even more. Is that what you're talking about, Joey, is spatial? That's exactly. What, but I, I think you're kind of off, Leo, because that's, exactly, that's what I'm talking about. But I also want to say that it, it's not the same music, Leo. I, you got to put money into it, Leo. You know, Leo, I don't know if you thought about this at all, but one thing I would really like to give Apple credit for it's them coming out saying that, hey, you know, you got to buy new equipment if you want to maximize well, <laughs> your listening. All right. Here. Yes. Okay. First of all, spatial, which means you need to have uh, an Apple device, whether it's a, a Mac, an iPad, an iPhone, or even the new Apple TV, or any Apple TV, I think, of uh, late vintage. You need to have those devices. They say it will work with any headphones, and it will work Leo, on a Leo, stereo you're with... You're going to have to spin it. You're going to have to spend about 400 bucks. Okay, I disagree, but let me finish my st statement and then we'll talk. You obviously are a music okay. lover, Joey. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then uh, you'll also need, if you want to listen on speakers, something that does Dolby Atmos decoding because this is coming through from the Apple TV as a Dolby Atmos signal. So I have, I took, uh, I have a lot of different headphones. And I took a and speakers and very good Elac speakers, a very good decoding system. I have um, I used uh, Scott Wilkinson's recommended um, uh, digital to analog decoder or DAC. He recommends the iFi um, Hip DAC, and I used that on my iPhone, on an iPad, uh, on an on a Mac. I've tried it in a variety of different formats with a variety of different headphones. Now I. 
tried it with Apple's recommended headphones. Unfortunately, Apple doesn't sell wired headphones. They only sell crappy, and I'm going to emphasize this, Bluetooth headphones. And it's not maybe Apple's fault, but Bluetooth cannot, because of bandwidth limitations, it's compressed, cannot give you good quality. Uh, so I spent $550 to try this on Apple's AirPods Max, and they're, they're just audio-wise a disappointing headphone. So very, do very not buy Apple's no. Bluetooth headphones. They're not yeah. good, and they don't make a wired headphone. Horrible. On the other hand, I, I have to disagree with you. I tried, and Scott recommended this. Sennheiser makes a wired uh, in-ear monitor called the IE300, and it's only 300 bucks. It sounds superb, and you definitely hear the spatial. I also tried it on a pair of $1,000 Hi-Fi Man electrostatic headphones, my best headphones, and it sounds even better, of course. Uh, so the bet, you know, if Why you... Why are you disagreeing with me? Well, I, I'm disagreeing because I there you can buy a $300 pair of headphones or a good, a good pair of Grados, and you'll well, you'll definitely yeah, hear the difference. I, Leo, I said $400, but there's a couple of things. I'm talking about the DAC and a set of headphones. Okay, good point. Good point. Okay, you have me there. Get a good deck. The <laughs> iFi, the iFi hip deck is about 129 bucks. So, Same, Leo. okay, you got me, Joey. They 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 kicked it out of the box, man. You got I got to give them credit, man. They, it's amazing. Dude. I I don't recommend doing it on wireless headphones, and unfortunately, Apple's taken out the no, headphone jacks for everything. So you need a DAC. Yeah, you need yeah. a way to connect. You got to have it. Yeah, you got and you got to, you need a good set of headphones too. You know, you can't. I think these uh, Sennheiser IE three hundreds are good, very yeah, good. They are. Um, but you paid what three hundred dollars? Three hundred bucks, which is very reasonable. Yeah, so that's not cheap. Yeah, no, no, no. And you, uh, the problem is there are expensive headphones that are not good. Yeah. <laughs> so go somewhere, uh, you know, where they really know headphones. I I actually uh, buy my headphones from a site called headphone.com where they really know know their stuff and you can trust their recommendations uh, but you, i agree with you joey in this respect if you've got a good hardware and software combination spatial now here's my question to you do you think spatial is as much better than stereo as stereo was to mono it is it is you you, you can you can definitely it's better I don't. I I go for that other end of it though, Leo. I go for the the bits, the uh, the uh, sixteen and the twenty four and the uh, hertz. You 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 yeah, think I mean, that high res makes a difference? Now I'm not going to say that it, it doesn't. A huge yeah, I'm not going to say that it doesn't. But I think to most people, you, they won't know. You need to be. You need to know what to listen for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't put the money. And another thing too, Leo, is you got to have Wi. Uh, you got to be on Wi-Fi too. Yeah, Bluetooth is not fast enough, so AirPlay Two is fine. Wi-Fi is fine. The best thing right. would be to get the audio locally, <laughs> and I think a CD is good enough to be honest with you. But uh, the best thing would be to listen to the audio from yeah, a local really source, good. download it, download the high-res version, and play it back through a good digital to analog converter, a DAC into good headphones. That's going to oh, be the best. Awesome. Yeah, then you're not doing wireless at all. Not even sure. Wi-Fi. Um, would you would you would, would you agree with me though, Leo? That you should we should probably give Apple a little bit of credit for for coming out saying that hey. Well, you know, I'm gonna first of all. New stuff. First of all, both of these formats have been around for predate Apple. You know, high res. I've been talking about high res for ten years since Neil Young started promoting it. Uh, that's you know that's not Apple, and spatial is really Apple's version of surround. And there have been many versions of this going back to the Who and Quadrophenia. So Surround is not new. In fact, Surround has come and gone. It's 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 like as much like 3D yeah. TV. It's kind of had its had it's it's, it's had several attempts. There was SACD and DVD audio. Uh, there was, as I mentioned, Quadraphonic. There's been a lot of Surround systems, and they've never really taken off. And I don't know if that's be. I think it's. I suspect it's because people can't don't really tell the difference and are not willing to invest in the difference. But I am with you, Joey. Probably the most important is a good is the good is the right hardware. Get the, get good pair of headphones, a good digital analog converter. It doesn't have to cost a huge amount. I think you're right, $400. You could plug that into your iPhone, you could plug that into an iPad. Um, and then uh, you're going to see you're going to definitely hear a difference. I'm not sure the high res makes that much charge, difference, but you think at some point Apple's going to charge charge money for it though at some point? No, 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 no. And the and so to finish with the thought, I'm sorry, I I, I 
drifted. I'm sorry, too. No, not your fault. My fault. Uh, Apple didn't invent this, but by Apple doing this, you know, remember iTunes is the number one music store in the world by far. You know, it surpasses all other music stores. By them doing this and offering this and offering it for free, I think they're really telling the record industry, start making stuff this way. This is the new stereo. So to their credit, even though this stuff's been around for a while, having Apple on this train, I think makes a very big difference. So I, I, will, I, I will give them credit. You're absolutely right, Joey. Always a pleasure. I'm glad you brought that up. I think it's an important topic. Thank you, Joey. I didn't. I ran out of time, but you, I'm glad you brought that up. And I'm going to bring in Scott too because I think Scott probably has some stuff to say about. Oh this man, well. I would love to hear his opinion, Leo. Yeah. Leo. Uh, Scott's, been, Scott's been Scott's been muted this whole time, Joey, and he's got. But I got. I want to. Yeah. <laughs> what do you What do you think about what Joey and I have just been talking I've, about? I've been jumping up and down here, man. <laughs> well, I knew. I wanted to give you a chance. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I, I certainly agree that spatial audio is, is a really good thing. I really enjoy it myself. I was sorry that more musicians don't take advantage of mixing in surround or Atmos. Uh, those that do, I think, it, in the early days, it was really kind of a gimmick, but now it really sounds great. Um, do you think, uh, so I asked Joey this, do you think it's, uh, spatial is to stereo what stereo was to mono. Is that a fair? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's awesome. When it's mono, awesome. when stereo awesome. came out, a lot of groups, including the Beatles, said, "Ah, yeah, I'm not going to stereo." <laughs> uh, yeah, it's gonna. It's a fad. It's a It'll fad. Fade. But yeah. and uh, I think a lot of consumers didn't care. But I think in time we just got used to it, and it really is a better way to listen. to It's music. a better way to do it if you do it well. I, I completely agree with everything you said. You need wireless. I mean, you need a wired or at, at the very least Wi-Fi, uh, AirPlay 2 or something like that. Bluetooth doesn't cut it. Um, but but getting a good pair of wired headphones with a good spatial audio system, man, it's awesome. What music it's do you really, listen to, yeah. Joey? What do you, where, do, where do you hear oh, it? Oh, man, I've been 50 years, man. A country, <laughs> classic rock, yeah. classic R&B because I'm a black guy. That's my main, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I so I, so last night, instead of turning on the news, we were cooking dinner. I said, Lisa, can we... Can we, we I've, I've got a great Elac surround system. i got a Dolby Atmos tuner. Can we listen to some spatial audio as we cook? And she said, absolutely. Put on Alicia Keys. And we were listening to her newest album. And it sounded phenomenal. But I have to say one thing that I have noted. I went out, and I mentioned this. I bought a Atmos receiver. Remember, Scott, I mentioned this. Oh, yeah, yeah. For the Apple TV. It still doesn't light up. Oh, we lost Joey. Oh, well. Oh, no. I hope he didn't hang up. Um, we lost... Uh, I, I plugged it in, and I did not get an Atmos signal. I got a stereo signal still. And it did not activate the center when, and the surrounds. When, so, you were, when you were streaming Apple Spatial? Not streaming it, but getting it from the Apple TV in spatial. Oh, okay. So when I so it does click into Dolby Five One when I listen watch a movie in surround. I get the surround, so the surround yeah. works. I don't know if this is a problem. I don't know. I'm I not, think Apple's I'm saying not. it's for two speakers, is what Apple's saying. Which means it's a what's called a virtualization system. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's also for two and I wasted headphones. and I also want to say I wasted my money because it doesn't I did not need an Atmos receiver for this. They say you do. I have to look more into it. I, I must admit I'm not convinced that it really is Atmos. It's not. Uh, I think it's virtu it's just as you said. It's, it's virtualized in uh, two speakers. And it sounds not to say it doesn't sound great. It does. Yeah. It it does. But if it's not utilizing all of the speakers, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a problem for me. I mean, there's a couple ways to do. Well, th there's virtualization, which is two speakers making it sound like it's surround. Yeah. And then there's what's called up mixing, which is taking a two channel signal and simulating surround, but you're activating all of your speakers and even your overheads if you have an a Atmos. Uh, your receiver may very well have an Atmos up mixer in it. I bought the uh, the Denon 1600 yeah. that we talked about. The 1600, that you like a okay. Lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it says Apple TV 4K and Apple TV HD, both of which I have. I have the mm -hmm. 4K. 
automatically plays sound in its highest quality supported by your home entertainment system. Yeah. Dolby 5.1 plays audio on multiple speakers as subwoofer. Right. But what does it say about the spatial audio? I need to do some more research on the spatial audio. To play movies and TV shows in Dolby Atmos from your Apple TV. Well, that's movies and TV shows. That's exactly right. Those have actual Dolby Atmos uh, encodes. But what about this spatial audio yeah, business? Yeah, I think it's. I think they're not doing it in music. I don't think so. And the other question I have, maybe you know the answer. Does are they have certain titles that are in that are in what they call spatial, right? Yes. So when you go okay. to Apple Music, uh, it will specifically say, and those will say Adobe Atmos in the those say Adobe Atmos. Yeah. And yet, when you play it on your Dolby Atmos it receiver, it does not trigger the Dolby Atmos. It does not. It does not. And I went into the, the settings uh, and I made sure the settings. Uh, you know, there are several weird settings, and I. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it doesn't seem to do. Okay, it. I've got. I got to do some research on. this. I wish somebody this, would talk to. I don't think Apple's really got this. They're not going to talk right. to anybody. Right. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I once had my very first podcast guest, as you remember, might remember, was Tom Holman. Yep. Who From once T he went THX T H. the T H of THX when he went to Apple, I asked him to be on the show again, and he said, "Nope, Apple won't let me talk to the press. Won't let me say anything to anybody." <laughs> so I can't. I can't. Well, we get have you know Renee Ritchie will talk to him, um, and I'll ask Renee. Okay. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. He might be close to retirement, so sooner than later. <laughs> no, not not uh, Thomas Holman, but uh, oh, but, somebody but he is at, at Apple, Apple. But somebody at Apple. Yeah, I don't think you could talk to Holman ever. Yeah, right. But somebody at Apple should know, and I and I would love to know more about exactly what they're doing. For example, with Sony 360 Reality Audio, the artist has to mix in that format. Right, has to remix their stems, as they're called. The the individual vocals and drums and guitars and bass and what have you all have to be remixed is that same is that same thing true with apple spatial or does apple spatial take two channel music and virtualize no, it no 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 they I, up music. i'm pretty sure it is not up mixing that you have okay, to okay so that you have to go back and remix, remix your stuff remix yes or when you're doing because the it's song. only stuff that's been mixed for spatial that shows up okay yeah all right I, and if it doesn't light up your Dolby Atmos indicator on your receiver, and the the extra speakers don't don't uh, aren't active, then you know it's got to be you, you mix it. It's so weird. You mix it for spatial, and yet all you get at the, as a consumer is virtualized. Why don't they send the, all the all the channels that are actually there if you're remixing for spatial? To have two set to, to have right, left, center, surrounds, maybe even overheads. Why aren't they sending all of that? Why are they virtualizing it? That's kind of kind of downshifting it to me. Well, um, I don't know. I want to know. Yeah. So if you got a if you got a way into Apple to find some answers to this, I'm all ears. Yeah. Um, Seriously. I'm gonna. I'm. I've got to keep. So your Morant says Dolby Atmos when you're playing. So Web 935 in the chat room says my Morant says Dolby Atmos when playing spatial music. So maybe I have something wrong in my setups. Hmm. I'll have to look. You know, there's there's two different devices that have to be properly configured, the Apple TV and the and receiver. And the receiver. The receiver is out of the box. Um, I did look through the settings, but maybe mm -hmm. there's a setting that doesn't allow Atmos unless you say specifically... Well, yeah, go, go look in. Go look in the audio menu. Yeah, uh, I have a Denon too. It's somewhat older than yours. Now, but... when I set it up with Odyssey, by the way, that worked really well. Now they give you a tripod. Hey, I got to run. Oh, too bad. Sorry, but we'll talk later. This was fun. Next week. <laughs> Next week. Why? Well, hey, hey, hey! How are you today, Leo Laporte, the tech guy? Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones. Smart watches, high quality music, 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number, 888 827 5536. I'm still trying to figure this out, and, and it certainly could be a user error on my part. Because uh, I, I wanted to hear, 
what's unclear with we, again we're talking about apple's spatial which again i want to say i think it is i never answered this i asked both scott wilkinson and uh, joey whether they thought it was as important an upgrade to stereo as stereo was to mono and i do think it is it's a little more subtle you know when you go from mono to stereo you really can hear it you know uh, but if you're using two speakers you can really hear it and there were, if, when stereo first came out there were a lot of people who thought it was marketing hype the beatles quite famously uh recorded their 1967 album sergeant pepper in mono mixed it in mono and then did a you know quick remix for uh, the american uh, audience not a very good one for the american audience uh you know just kind of saying oh I'll put, I'll put the guitar in the left and put the bass in the right and that was it you know um so a lot of the so-called uh, stereo mixes from the Beatles of their earlier albums are considered not good. <laughs> Purists say, listen to the mono. And in fact, when the 50th anniversary uh, version of Sgt. Pepper came out, they included a mono version of it, remixed, because that's how the Beatles originally intended it. Uh, however, uh, you know, and that's, uh, I think, always the case. A new format comes out. Uh, it's reasonable to be skeptical. The music industry is like any other industry. Marketing is paramount. And I think there was probably the feeling that, well, they're just promoting this so you'll buy new records. But stereo did make a difference. And it's possible that it's going to take a while for spatial to take off. But I think spatial will make that kind of difference. Now, the thing that I'm still not clear about... Um, Spatial, Apple is saying, is encoded using Dolby Atmos. Atmos is the latest version of Dolby. And I poo-pooed it when Scott Wilkinson would bring it up because the idea was it's to duplicate the movie theater experience and have speakers in the ceiling. <laughs> now, in a movie, maybe, you know, a helicopter flies over, you want it to be above your head. I don't particularly want any music to be above my head. Uh, I like a broader sound stage, more like if you're at a concert and, you know, you, you the music is spread out in front of you. But it's never, in any case, unless you've got a bass player in the, in the upstairs playing above you. But it, so I, and I didn't really care that much for movies, so I did not buy the overhead speakers. There's, you know, mostly people buy reflecting speakers. I have you know, cathedral ceilings in my living room, so it's not going to work anyway. So you could buy up, upward firing speakers that bounce off the ceiling, come back down and give you that effect. I never did that. So I never got an Atmos receiver because I said, no, I don't, I don't need that. I'm fine. I don't even need seven one surround. I just have the 5.1, the, the two surround speakers. Um, but this Apple, they said, well, no, we're using Dolby Atmos. So I went out to get a Dolby Atmos receiver, spent a few hundred bucks to get a good quality Denon uh, X1600H Dolby Atmos receiver, audio video receiver. And yes, in fact, it does the Dolby Atmos for movies. Apparently, Dolby Atmos is more than just having downward firing speakers. It's really about uh, a new encoding that can also be used to virtualize that sound, to spread it out even without all of those additional speakers. At least that's what Apple's saying. Apple says Dolby Atmos works fine with two speakers, a left and right headphone. In fact, I think spatial audio is really designed for their headphones primarily. But I wanted to hear it in my surround sound living room with 5.1. And I have yet to be able to get that to happen uh, with this receiver. But it could be a human error. It could be me not getting the settings right. One of our chatters says... Um, that it should show up as Dolby Atmos on the receiver. So maybe I have something set wrong. I'm going to I'm going to play with it when I get home. And I'm actually he's now uh, Matt in our chat room has sent me <laughs> a uh, the manual from the Denon. <laughs> Please select the Dolby Atmos mode for content encoded with Dolby Atmos. Ah, so maybe I have to actually turn that on. 
This is what Denon says. If you've selected a different sound mode previously, please select again this mode for Dolby Atmos content playback. It decodes Dolby Atmos content and its positioning data in real time and outputs audio from the appropriate speakers, creating natural audio images regardless of the speaker layout. Use ceiling speakers and or Dolby Atmos enabled speakers to realize a three-dimensional sound field. I'll say I'm not doing that. An immersive audio experience can be enjoyed from traditional speaker layouts that do not employ overhead or Dolby Atmos enabled speakers by selecting the speaker virtualizer feature. So this is more complicated than I thought. Oh, and then it says asterisk, the uh, speaker virtualizer feature will be supported via firmware update. So it's not, <laughs> it's not even out yet. All right. I'll, I'll go back into the settings and see. I just I want to figure this out because I don't want pe to people to have to go out and buy an Atmos receiver just to hear spatial music. But I do think spatial is good. Many of us have surround sound systems for watching movies. If Apple now with its Apple TV provides surround sound music, be nice, right? 8888 Ask Leo. Kenny, uh, I'm sorry, Kenny's coming up. Let's go to Alan from Huntington Beach, California, our next caller. Got to do him in order. Hi, Alan. Hello there. How are you, Leo? I am well. How are you? I'm doing good. I have a question about, I'm a big Samsung uh, fan. I love their products and all that good stuff. And I'm just curious because it just seems like I've heard more things about the security of the iPhone yeah. versus... Uh, well, because yeah, that's, a, a, remember, elaborate. that's marketing, right? It's all marketing. <laughs> so the iPhone and Android phones, one thing that has changed, and it's, I think, for the better, is the data is automatically encrypted on modern Android phones and all iPhones. So anything you have on there is scrambled, and the key to that is stored... In what in on the Samsung phones, it's a it's a software secure enclave. In many cases, on the Apple phones, there's a hardware secure enclave where the keys are stored. That is, in theory, inaccessible to anybody. So even if somebody has your phone, they can't see what's on it. That's a good okay. thing. That's an important privacy thing. But there's more to security than that, obviously, with ransomware and bad guys and malware and so forth. Apple's uh, got a lot of. Uh, I think, security built into their iPhone. And they say the most important security feature is the Apple App Store. Uh, they want, you know, you can only put apps on there, uh, on an iPhone, from the App Store, and the App Store apps are checked for security. Now, that has not kept some malware out of there. The malware people are very clever, and they've got lots of ways of getting around it. So they have successfully gotten around it in some uh, times Android tries to do the same. I think does not do quite as good a job. But I would say, in terms of overall security, modern Android phones, certainly your Sam, any recent Samsung, are very secure. In fact, the Pentagon has approved the Samsung Knox phones, which is any late model Samsung Galaxy or Note, uh, for use in the Pentagon. So I think that's a pretty good seal of approval. Yes. Yeah, and, and and I think that's probably you were just talking about the App Store, and that is exactly uh, one of the articles that I had just read, and it said that a Samsung phone was like forty five times or forty seven times more susceptible to malware <laughs> through the App That's Store. made up. And that's made okay, up. Well, that's I, you know that's what? a made I up. Don't even know how to, how to <laughs> decipher all these things. So anymore. there's you two know? things on an Android phone. You can sideload you can turn off that protection and they'll even give you a big warning it's in the settings uh allow third-party downloads and it says well watch out this could be dangerous so that's really is more risky uh, but if you stick to the google play store or the samsung store for your apps okay i would say maybe not quite it's certainly not 47 times more dangerous <laughs> it's not maybe apple and uh, stuff sneaks by apple too you still, on Apple or on any mobile device, you still need to be prudent about where you get your apps. And I don't mean which store, I mean who makes it. Don't download the Russian wallpaper app. Dangerous, right? Don't get the latest Chinese uh, news headline app. Think about where you're getting it from. But if you're getting it from well-known names, uh, you're almost always safe in either app store. So, the, so there is a burden on you to be a little cautious. 
this is this is an important thing to underline. Anytime you put any software on any computing device, smartphone, tablet, laptop, or desktop, you're opening up security holes. You're depending on the people who made that software to have made it properly so it's not insecure and not to be malicious. There's a lot of trust anytime you're running anybody's program. So only get programs from people you trust and be very careful and only install programs you absolutely need. Okay, well, that, that pretty much answers my question. And I don't think if you do that, Android's any less secure. I think it's absolutely as secure. Now, I've, there are people I know who go to the hacker conference, DEF CON in Vegas every year, who said, I'd never bring an Android phone to that. Uh, I also talk to people who said, I'd never bring any phone to that <laughs> or a laptop. So you have to consider also the environment. Uh, do you work for the NSA, CIA, or FBI? No. No. So you're probably okay. If you're being targeted, my point there is, if you're being targeted because you're at a hacker conference or because you work for a three-letter agency, all bets are off. Uh, nothing right. is completely secure. But as, as a normal person walking around, I think being normally prudent is fine. Don't worry, in other right. words. Oh, yeah. uh, well, I appreciate that because I saw an ad that had my name on it and it said, refinance your house now. <laughs> and my wife and I had just been talking about refinancing. <laughs> And I'm like, th this is getting out of. Control. That's and not from there. spying on you. They do know your name. Uh, be, you know, that's 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 part of the. You know, that's unfortunate. I shouldn't know your name, but they do know your name if you've used, you know, uh, Google Play Store and you've bought anything and you've logged into Google. They got your name from Google. Uh, Google probably sold that ad. And you maybe been talking about refinancing, but also they they also look at your house, what interest rate you're paying all of which is public information, I hate to tell you, uh, and get it from that too. Privacy, I don't think the phone is spying on you, but privacy is a little bit these days harder to come by. You know, your, your home purchase, your purchase price, your loan, all of that's public record. Exactly. Unfortunately. Now, is Alexa any worse or no? No, it's all the same. It's all the same. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think if you... You can be more private. Um, there's a great site I would recommend if you really... If you're a privacy uh, purist called Privacy Tools that is... Uh, I think it's privacytools.io uh, that is okay. run by privacy advocates. This is the... Uh, the statement at the front of the page, you are being watched. <laughs> Private and state-sponsored organizations are monitoring and recording your online activity. Privacy tools provide services, tools, and knowledge, probably the knowledge is more important, to protect your privacy against global mass surveillance. So it's certainly worth reading all that if you really, if like, if private, I don't care that much about privacy. I live in public, right? I'm on the air. People know my name. But if you really care about it, um, it's probably worth going to that site and reading up. I will do that. I totally appreciate the information. My pleasure. I, that's a great right, question. A good day. Take care. Don't feel, I think people uh, maybe think, oh, I have an Android phone. Am I cursed? No. <laughs> it's fine. But it's probably good to be, uh, to learn. And a lot of times when we talk about privacy and we talk about security, we're talking about Forgive this. The unwashed masses. People who don't listen to this show. We're talking to normal people who aren't paying a lot of attention. So what we're really saying is, are the defaults enough to protect you? Is the way it's configured, if you don't know anything about this, enough to protect you? And I'm probably not. You know, I, I think if you care about privacy, you it would absolutely be worth looking into. You know, going to a site like privacytools.io and looking into, you know, what the risks are. I think you can go crazy. You can go a little, get a little too worried about it. Uh, certainly, I haven't suffered any negative consequences by living in public. So, you know, I, uh, but, it, but, you know, I understand. I don't want to, also, I don't want to uh, downplay any fears you have. It's reasonable to worry about it. Pay attention to it. Yeah, there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of speculation about McAfee. He tweeted when he first went to jail in October. 
He said, I love it here. The food is great. People are nice. If I commit suicide, if, if you learn that I've learned that I've died in jail, it will not be by suicide. It'll be like Epstein because he was uh, one of the people who said, oh, Epstein didn't kill himself. Um, but so as a result, you're going to see a lot of conspiracy theories that McAfee uh, didn't kill himself. I'm not sure why he would be killed in prison. <laughs> I could Epstein is a little more credible since he presumably had lots of very damaging information that would be problematic for a lot of people. Um, I don't know if McAfee knew anything. And I, uh, so I don't know if his wife knows whether he was suicidal or not. The the fact that this happened literally an hour or two after he learned he was going to be extradited to the United States where he would face a potential 30-year stay in prison might have had something to do with it. You know, he was faced with life in prison. And he also used a lot of drugs. A lot of drugs. So, I think... You know, the food isn't as good in the U.S. prison. Food is not as good in... I'm sure Spanish prisons have better food. <laughs> I, I'm not going to buy into this conspiracy theory. The problem is we don't know, and we probably will never know. We, when Apple discontinued the HomePod, they kept they still do the HomePod Mini. John John Gerard is uh, talking about this. When Apple discontinued it, we certainly talked about it on MacBreak Weekly. It was definitely a story. Um, so remember, HomePod is HomePod the four hundred nine dollar version and the hundred dollar version. The hundred dollar version it continues. And that's where spatial audio will live. But I have to point out, Apple does not make any device that will do justice to spatial audio. <laughs> not the AirPods, not the AirPods Pro, not the AirPods Pro Max, uh, and not the HomePods Mini. None of those will do any justice to spatial audio. So, Or certainly uh, high-res audio. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Cold as ice. Scott is on the line <laughs> from Inland Empire, California. Hi, Scott. Hey, good day, Leo. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Nice to talk to you. Uh, Welcome. Thank you for taking the call. Thank yeah, you. I'm, I'm hoping to get a little focus today. My wife and I are moving to Belize, and I am keeping a presence in the U.S. as well with uh, clients that I have. Nice. So, Are you moving to Belize to retire, to like retire there or just because uh, you have business there? Nope. We're moving to retire. We nice. were able to find an affordable setup. It gave us a nice looking beach. and uh, kind, uh, kind of my dream to live in the tropics on the beach, man. That would be so nice. Well, get used to the heat and humidity because yeah. it's the tropics. For yeah. real. Um, so the, the conversation today revolves around cell phones and how to approach that. Uh, I have a nephew in the military in Japan, and he's uh, recommended Google Voice. So I've looked at that a little bit. Um, our our concern there is consistent Wi-Fi, because that would be a requirement to make that 100% effective. Uh, then I've also thought about, I don't know what a dual SIM cell phone would do for me. I think you're still registered with two different cell phones. You want, you want to keep an American phone number? Is that the point? I, I need to because if you're there permanently, you should just get a Belizean, you know, phone and a Belizean phone right. number. Uh, but you're right. If you want to keep an American number, uh, then you might either want a dual SIM phone. I would suggest. I think Google Voice is a good idea because you can get a U.S. number through Google Voice for free and have it forward to whatever number, including the Belizean number, you want. So you can give clients in the U.S you know, a number with your area code, you know, with an 818 area code uh, that then calls you in Belize. They'll never know you're in Belize. And you don't have to have a cell, uh, a Verizon contract or something no. here for that. It'll call, it'll call a landline if you want. 
Oh, awesome. Okay. So I think that's I think that's the best solution. Hang on for a second. I got to take a break. We're gonna come back in uh, just a little bit with more Johnny Jet, our travel guru. I think he's back. We'll talk to him next. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. So. Um, it really depends what you want. Obviously, if you're there permanently, which it sounds like you are, you're going to just end up having a Belizean SIM. It'll be a lot. Data will be cheaper. Everything will be cheaper. Down the road, I have to point out, Starlink is going to happen. Okay, and I was that's another thing that's come up on the list. I mean, I've got, you know, eight different choices in front of me. That's why I'm saying I need some focus here because I'm on <laughs> the planet. So when does when does Skylink or Starlink, or which is Elon Musk's satellite internet service, will be a boon. In fact, we were watching a, a TV show uh, last night called Startup, and Ron Perlman lives in a basically where you're going, kind of where you're going to be living in a tropical paradise. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, I, I was telling my wife that's where I want to live, <laughs> but we got to wait till Starlink is available. Starlink will be a great solution for you, but no one knows when it'll be available. Eventually, you know, they're launching these satellites. They're in beta tests in northern U.S. And, and Canada right now. I would say within a year, you'll be able to get it in Belize. Oh, well, then within a year, you, know, you could just live with dual cell setups and suffer the cost. Oh, you'll be, you'll be you in know. hog heaven. You're going to have to put that dishy McDish face, the, that's what they call it, I'm not making that up, the little satellite dish on a pole because it has to, it has to have a clear view of as much of the sky as possible. The satellites are moving. So right. um, you uh, way above the tree line. But you put it on a tall pole or whatever, and then you're going to have... We're on the top floor of our complex. Perfect. That's nice. Yeah. And then you're going to have 100 megabit or better internet access. So you're going to really be great in great shape, I think. Oh, well, that's a real blessing because uh, what we get now is uh, I think we're looking at uh, maybe 10 down, 5 or 10 yeah. down, and, yeah. and 30 It won't be good. Up to yeah. Be, yeah, right. Yeah. So. It's funny because right. we always assume the U.S. has the best internet. It actually has among the worst. But there are places with worse, and it really depends on how well they're wired and so forth. But that's for me, that's what I'm waiting for is Starlink to become globally available because then I can live anywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I heard, if I you, heard there you is a... Um, bucks now. Say again? I said I thought I heard you could get on it now for like 100 bucks a month. Is that you can in beta. I don't know if that applies in Belize. It's geographically restricted. But you should go to the Starlink site. It costs $500 for the gear, that dish. And then it's $99 a month. And they don't guarantee any particular speed, but people who have it right now are reporting... At least 100 megabits, as long as you have a very clear view of the sky. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, up on our floor, uh, we should be able to turn it to the heavens and we'll just let it rip. Because yeah, there's, good. There's nothing above good. There's nothing yeah. above you. It's good. Yeah. Uh, it, right. I'm looking at Broadband Speed Checker at broadbandspeedchecker.co.uk, and their ISPs in Belize say the average, you're right, the, uh, the speed is bad. Average download speed is 15 megabits, up is 8 the fastest ISP in Belize is something called Squitter, Squitter Networks, and then Southern Cable Network. But if you're in an apartment complex, you probably don't have a choice. No, we are looking at uh, Digicel or Smart. That's yeah. The cell companies that are down there, they're feeding us. So. Oh, okay. You're going to use Cell. Yeah. So I expect that oh, to get better, especially if there are more expats down there. I expect that to get better. But Dishy yeah. McDishface is going to be here. Your savior. <laughs> so one other comment, Leo, and I know this isn't on the air right now because you're at the Well, we're on the podcast, so people are listening. Oh, okay. So I'm very impressed by the fact that you don't stop working during all of these breaks where when I was just a radio listener on KFI... Uh, yeah, you, you you don't get you only get half the show <laughs> on the radio. Exactly. There's a lot of great stuff, so I'm going to have to find out. You know, well, we put it on the podcast, so if you yeah, the yeah. podcasts are at twit.tv and uh, or techguylabs.com, and the okay. podcast well, has really everything. When you go to Belize, that's going to be the way to listen. Yep, that's what we're going to do. Hey, stay in touch. I'm really curious how this goes for you. That's where John McAfee was. Oh, is that right? Yeah, well, he was on the run because. There was this, his his uh, neighbors died under suspicious circumstances, and he was wanted for questioning and disappeared. Went to when they went to Spain. Belize, per se, or was yeah, he Belize, in yeah, America somewhere. No, he he was in well, Belize. Oh. Then he went to uh, Spain, and uh, of course uh, was about to be extradited. Hey, I got to run. Yeah, yeah. All right, later. Thanks. 
He's been everywhere, man. He's a traveling guy once again. Yay, Johnny Jet. Our travel guru is here. Hey, Johnny. Hello, Leo. How you doing? I am so great. Have you? Did you go anywhere this week? I sure did. Where'd I you went go? To, uh, Catalina Island. Oh, nice. First time in over a decade. My wife's first time. Obviously, my kid's first time. And I got to tell you, I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, it's like a world away, even though it's 22 miles off the coast. Um, we took Catalina Express. It takes an hour. And then we stayed at two different hotels, the Atwater and the Metropole. And, you know, I loved it except for the Wi-Fi and the T-Mobile service. T-Mobile's terrible there. Most locals have Verizon, I learned. So uh, keep that in mind. And if I was still there, I would not be able to be doing this probably because the Wi-Fi was pretty bad. Well, we, Actually, don't, we don't go to these places <laughs> for uh, work. We go for relaxation. For sure. But I'm always working. I guess and, so. Uh, huh? But honestly, it's really an incredible place. You rent a golf cart for two hours. It's $110. You go around, you know, Avalon and the views are just jaw dropping. And and it's a great destination for kids. I mean, we went on a glass bottom boat, saw the fish. I mean, my son's mind was blown. Was it pretty quiet or is it starting to pick up? It's starting to pick up. But, um, you know, the trick that I learned is take the ferry in the morning. That's usually when it's calmer. And also we took the ferry back in the morning and there was no one on it. Um, but going there packed. So, um, you know, time it correctly and you still have to wear a mask on the boat. Um, not n n pretty much nowhere in the Island. You need to wear a mask. Um, but people are starting to wear masks again. And you know, this new Delta variant is starting to throw a little wrench into people's plans. Even though today, uh, the TSA reported that, um, we broke a record yesterday, 2.13 <gasps> uh, million travelers it's went back, through baby. The, the highest, the highest yet. It's the eighth time this month that over 2 million people have gone through, uh, U S security checkpoints. So that's a good sign. I'm just worried about these Delta variants. I mean, uh, South Sydney, Australia is on lockdown now. Portugal's having problems. Israel is talking about not allowing tourists right now because of it. And, and, and Israel has a lot of, most people are vaccinated. So I'm a little worried about the future for that part. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we're going to Hawaii in a couple of weeks. We're going to wear masks. Although I'm pleased to see that the big governor. News. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. No, I mean, uh, so Hawaii's big news came out a couple of days ago. Uh, starting July 8th, if you're if you are fully vaccinated in the United States, not just Hawaii, you can go without testing or quarantine, and that's huge. Although I've had some readers saying that they've tried to upload their CDC card, which you need to do, to the um, Hawaii Oh, you website. have to upload it before you, you go? Yeah, but, but I See, don't think I have it's my physical yet. card. I'm going to carry it with me. So what day are you going? Because I don't think July 8th is set in stone because they're like, that's what the day they're expecting. We're going July 12th. So oh, wow, you got lucky. <laughs> I think we got lucky. Yeah. We were we were preparing to take the tests, but uh, if I don't have to get a test, I'm gonna, probably not going to. They're you know, in, in fairly no, invasive. I, I, I agreed. But um, yeah, I don't know if you can do it yet. I know yesterday you could not because I had readers uh, tell me that. But uh, try it out and test it out and uh, let me know. Also, Canada has big news this week, although not as good as Hawaii, but they're ending hotel quarantine for the fully vaccinated who are Canadians. Uh, we're all, all Americans and other... They don't trust uh, our vaccines? No, I don't think it's that. I just... <laughs> You know, I was, I was, I've been reading up on it because my wife's Canadian and uh, we, she really wants to see her family and I can't blame her. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, they're, they're not clear rules. We don't know. Like, you know, I think, I think we can get in, but my, our kids will still have to quarantine for two weeks. So under 12, you have to quarantine and, um, and Americans aren't allowed in yet. So they're all hoping that July 21st they'll announce it or the 19th. But I was just speaking, speaking to one of my Canadian friends. They think it's going to be August 21st, which, I mean, summer's over by then. Kids are back in school almost. Oh, I know. It's too bad. It's so, hard so for, for people like you with a Canadian wife and family up there. It's really hard. I mean, we flew to New York last week or a week and a half ago, and we were flying over. And I go, look, I always w watch the map, the, the flight map. And I go, look over there, and you could see the lake. And I go, there's there's a CN Tower in Toronto. And my wife just started crying. Oh. And it, it brings me to tears because that's how much she misses her family. And I just hope that she can get to see them. Oh, so, yeah, it's um, got to be really hard. And I'm sure the family wants to see the kids. 
Oh, for sure. I mean, my, my daughter was two months old when they saw her. Now she's yeah. almost two. So it's a, it's, a it's going to be a, it's a big change. Yeah. But there's been a lot of news this week also. Um, by the way, if you're flying Southwest this weekend, they just announced they're doing a lot of cancellations proactive. 150 flights today. What? They've canceled. They say be, they say it's because of thunderstorms in Denver, Orlando, Chicago, and St. Louis. Yikes. But but a lot of people think it's also labor issues, and same thing with American Airlines. Well, they're having labor issues. Let's bring up that labor issues, because that's kind of interesting. It's they're, uh, They can't find enough people. Right? They can't. No. I mean, almost every industry. I mean, restaurants. One of the hotels we were staying at in, in Avalon, they didn't have maid service. You know, and they used COVID as an excuse. Um, so, and I know a lot of hotels still do that. Well, other hotels are not. And I think it's just because they're short on on staff and waiters. You know, even in Greece, they're saying they couldn't find waiters. Um, this was this was the problem with rental car companies, which is they sold their fleets during COVID because they didn't need yep. them. Now they yep. can't buy cars to replace them. I guess yep. these companies laid off employees during COVID. And now, is it that people don't want to go back to work? What's going on? I, I, I'm not 100% sure. I've heard different things. I've heard that people are still getting government money, so they, they're making the same as money as staying home. As soon as that 600 bucks wears out, I don't know when yeah, that's and I that think, ends. And I think that's August or September, so yeah. I think that will change drastically, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But also, uh, you know, a lot of people had to lay off company, people, and they had to be retrained. Well, and maybe they got jobs somewhere else, right? For sure, without a doubt. But also, the, and the car rentals is not because of shortage of staff, it's because of that computer chip problem. Them. Right. Um, and right. You know, let's hope let's hope that changes. By the way, were you able to get a car rental in Hawaii? I don't need a car rental. We're going to Honolulu. Okay. I'm gonna so take gonna the just... uh, the Ohana Wiki Wiki. So how are you gonna get from the airport to your hotel? Well, can I take a cab? You can. You can. Sometimes those lineups are long. I well, mean, we'll put up it with could be that. an hour. You know what? You know what we're doing. We're doing that's smart. I think is. We're, uh, we have we love uh, toursbylocals.com, which is uh, a place where locals offer guides, uh, you know, and so we've signed up for, I think, two or three so that we can get to various places. These guides will That's drive smart. us there. They come, they meet you at the hotel. You go, hey, and you get in the car. One of them has a nice big convertible Cadillac. You get in the car and you drive to where you're going. I can't is wait. Is it private? It's private. It's too. private. Yeah, they're yeah, all private. You, you can, I've taken Ubers from the airport. Um so there are different tricks you can use. I would I would find out from. I didn't even think so, of that. Um, yeah, try and get the tours by locals to pick you up at the airport, drop you off at the uh, hotel, and, and and do the tour. Are there are there besides Uber and taxis? Are there other kinds of airport? Uh, Definitely, I've taken I've taken Black Lane before. Black Lane, uh, yeah, that's the one you but talked you, about. But yeah. But you, I mean, you can use. I, I don't. I don't think Black Lane. I, I don't think the, um, the 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 big guys like that are allowed inside the airport in terms of like greeting you. But they'll be curbside. I don't care about side. that. I'll, I'll bring the. I can. We can roll our bags to the curb. That's not the end. Yeah, of the I think there's only a few companies allowed inside at baggage claim. So everything. I guess the point is everything's still a little bit rocky up in the air. We don't know whether to wear masks. There may not be a maid in the hotel. Stuff like that. We're still working this out. We're just coming out slowly. A lot yeah. of flights being canceled. I think you're right. I think labor issues might as well, might also be part of the problems with flight cancellations. I know it has been for other airlines. There is, that for sure. Yeah. But you know what? Let's just be grateful that we're traveling again. 2.1 million people going through checkpoints. That is that is an accomplishment. That's that great. I didn't think it was going to happen this soon. We're getting back to business. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Johnny Jet, you'll find him at johnnyjet.com. He's got a newsletter, several newsletters. They're all free. They're great. Some of them will save you lots of money on airfare. He also has a YouTube channel I highly recommend with 39 questions of travel experts. He's got a podcast at johnnyjet.com slash podcast. He's on Instagram. He's on Twitter. Follow Johnny Jet. You won't be sorry. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. I'm going to follow you. you to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, I just... Uh, Made an account at travel.hawaii.gov and to see if I can upload my um, my yeah. card there. Are you doing a show next week? Uh, it's 4th of no. July. No. Uh, yes, I'm on the 3rd of July, which is Saturday. I, I'll, I'll okay. be here. You don't have okay, to good. if you no, want to no, take the day off. No, no. I, I, you Sunday know, we're supposed to be, be flying uh, the next day. but Yeah, the next day I, I won't be here. But, uh, we, yeah, we nobody... We rarely do shows on the holidays because nobody wants to buy ads. 
<laughs> I, 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 I can't blame them. So on it'll that be one. a rerun. I would have no traffic. Yeah, but Saturday I'll be here. I like Saturday. Um, there is a video that WestJet. I just, I did, actually, I just did a, um, a travel tip in my newsletter today. One was about best cell phones international. Oh, and which was. You know, for Trudis with your last caller, although he's living there, so it's a little bit different. Yeah, see, if you're going to stay, that's why I asked you. He's staying. Get a local phone. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I use Google Fi, which has it costs the that, same U.S. or local. It's great. That's what I was going to ask you, because I had a guest post. I had someone write a guest post, my buddy yeah. Sebastian from Cellular Broad. I love Google Fi. No nonsense, but he didn't put Google Fi in there, and people commented on that. So now I need to update that post with Google Fi. Uh, basically, uh, thanks to T-Mobile, which offered low speed, but at least data internationally, um, both Verizon and AT&T said, we better get our international act together. So Verizon does day passes. It's still expensive. AT&T, you buy ahead, still expensive. Um, T-Mobile is okay, but you're going to end up buying higher speed. Really, the best is Google Fi. You keep your number. Um there are charges for international calls, but they're almost everywhere reasonable. You should check ahead. And then the data is the same in the U.S. as it is worldwide. So it's 10 bucks a gigabyte. So, And it caps out at 60, I think. So it's a really good deal. I, I always have a five phone for travel. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's good to know. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. If you've got a question, a comment, a suggestion, don't forget everything we talk about. Uh, ends up with a link at techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. Now, finally, Kenny, you've been very patient from Cottontown, Tennessee. Kenny's on the line. Hi, Kenny. Hi, Leo. It's great to be on your show. I am a first time caller. Nice. Welcome. Good to have you. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I really appreciate you uh, getting the uh, name of the city right. I know that when the phone screener mentioned it she was kind of confused it's it is called cotton town tennessee uh, and i don't know if we actually grew cotton there but is it next door to rocky top area. no that's in the <laughs> eastern side of tennessee. Okay. we are in the we're in the middle side of it, it how is it is it spelled cotton town or is it uh, contracted it it is it's in one one word okay cool that's I know it's pretty confusing. But is it a is it a anyway, is it a beautiful place? Is it in the Smoky Mountains? It actually, uh, it kind of is in a lot of ways. Um, it's a little bit more urbanized though than say Eastern Tennessee is. Uh huh. I love Tennessee. Beautiful state. Well, well what can I do it for sure you, is. Kenny? Well, I have a couple of Windows uh, 11 related questions. As you probably well, you know this. Be very this controversial, is isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is very controversial because we all assumed that Windows 10 would be it. Apparently, it is not. It's all part of them getting up to that two trillion dollar mark, I guess. <laughs> well, and to be that. very fair to Microsoft, they never said this is the last version of Windows. One Microsoft developer advocate said it at a conference once, <clears throat> and he, in the way he said it, I actually watched this. The quote: His name was Jerry Nixon. He might have meant the latest version of Windows, not the last version of Windows. He said the last version of Windows, but it was then blown up by the press, and and I'll include myself, because I repeated it over and over again, that this was the last version of Windows. Microsoft never corrected it, but to be fair, they never really said it either. So they're right on schedule. It's been five years since Windows 10 came out. This is about when you would announce a new version of Windows. Um, so they're they're doing what they've always done. Uh, are you excited about Windows 11? Have you taken a look at it? Yeah, I actually have taken a look at it. Uh, it's because I do have a Mac, and it is very similar in as far as the structure. It's very Mac-ish looking. More, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they they meet that goal. Uh, as far as if you were to go and get a new Windows uh, 11 computer of any type. Uh, you recommend, I know in the past, uh, I guess, what, 8 or 16 gigabytes to have? Yeah, Microsoft says 4 is the minimum. That's a very low minimum, but it's more than the 1, they said, for Windows 10. Uh, I would say 8 is usual. For most people, is fine. Uh, 16 is, is probably the sweet spot. What happens is, as you buy more memory, the price goes up, but the performance doesn't go up at the same rate. 
So you're kind of looking for the place where the perf you maximize performance for a reasonable price, and I would say 16 is probably okay. But if that's still a, you know a, a stretch, eight would it would run just fine in eight. That's good because yeah. the way I have it worked, and I think it's the best way to run Windows of any type outside of an enterprise system, is I do it virtually through a virtual machine, ah. Perl's desktop. Well, that's because you're on a Mac, of course. But yeah, that's, that's right. not a bad way to go. In fact, I think that's the future of Windows. I think that's exactly what what uh, Apple, I'm sorry, what Microsoft wants to do. They're later this year going to release a virtualized Windows for uh, I think for consumers and businesses, and I think that in the long run that may end up being the future of Windows. So you're kind of you're kind of uh, ahead of the ahead of the game. Yeah, I always want to try to be because I've tried to run Windows 10 on just straight alone machines, and depending on what you get, it's more hit and miss. But yeah. I do want to ask you about uh, with Apple releasing new iMacs and the new chips that they have to replace Intel. Uh, my Mac is about over five years old, about as old as well, Windows it's, 10 it's is. It's time to upgrade, yeah. So it is time to upgrade. Oh, absolutely. Now, I wouldn't do it today, necessarily. Um, so what Apple's done is, they've done this in the past. This is their third time that they've changed chips. You know, Microsoft's always worked on Intel <laughs> chips, or a, what we call the x86 platform. But uh, Apple has gone through several different chip manufacturers, first Motorola, then PowerPC, then Intel, and now they're making their own. And as a user of the new M1 chip and from all the benchmarks I've seen, there's no question, th not only is this, this, it's obviously the future of Apple for at least the next 10 years, it's also, and probably forever, it's also significantly better in two ways. They're much lower power chips than Intel. And in many cases, they're faster, uh, even faster for a much lower price. The, the low power is important because that also means low heat. It means you don't have to design systems with as big a fan. Uh, you can run at a faster speed. A lot of Intel laptops with i7 chips, and Apple too, to be fair, with i7 chips, never can run at full speed because it's too hot. And so they have to slow them down to keep from overheating the system. You're not going to have that problem with the M1 chip. So I do think this is a very, very good platform and is absolutely the future of Apple. The reason I say maybe not today is by this, I would say by this fall, we're going to see more Macs with a newer M1 chip, the M1X chip. We're going to see laptops probably a new Mac Mini, and by the end of the year, I think we'll see uh, iMac Pro and Mac Pro. We're going to see high-end stuff. If you need a Mac today, you'll be very happy. I have the MacBook Pro with the M1 chip. It it runs circles around every other Mac. In fact, I retired my iMac Pro with an Intel Xeon chip in it because it was just so much faster. I didn't want to use the iMac Pro, which was considerably more expensive. So if you need a Mac today, you probably do. Yours is pretty old. Uh, I think the any one of the M1 Macs, depending on how you feel about the form factor, they're all the same chip, would be a great choice. And if you can wait till the fall, you're going to see even faster M1s. Yeah, that's my plan is to kind of wait and see which more of the new Macs that they have come out and then kind of go from there. Because I have one that's a 27-inch. I know they just came out with a 21-inch. Yeah, I'm hoping the 24. The they're now. Yeah, I don't think... My, it's my thought that this these were the entry level. All of the Macs, the M1, one Max so far are entry level versions of those respective machines. They will have higher end versions of all of those machines, and probably this fall with the new M1 X. M1 X will give you more RAM. These tap out at 16. It will give you more Thunderbolt ports. These tap out at 2. And I think we'll probably have faster graphics. Now, these, the, the, they are no longer supporting NVIDIA or AMD graphics. They're Apple graphics mm -hmm. as well. And I would say right now the top-of-the-line i9 MacBook Pro graphics are better with a Radeon in it than the, the M1 MacBook Pro. But that's going to, I suspect, change. Apple's going to have to respond to that. So I think better graphics, if you need good graphics, uh, will come this fall. All right. Well, I'll definitely keep that in mind. I really appreciate you 
uh, taking my call and great questions. These questions. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Nice to talk to you. But the the thing I was expecting was, and we talked about it at the beginning of the show. You know, Microsoft announced Windows 11, but also announced uh, the requirements. And one of the there are two requirements that are scaring people. One is this TPM chip, the Trusted Platform Module. This is a security hardware security chip that is built into many PCs over the last couple of years. But we'll leave a lot of older PCs, self-built PCs, hobbyist PCs out. So that's interesting. That means they're going to have to keep Windows 10 around. Well, they've already said we're going to keep it around through 2025. Um, so you will have till 2025 if you want to get Windows 11, but you'll have to get a new machine. I think this is probably, Windows 11 really is primarily intended to sell new machines and to run on new machines. I think that that actually is the case. But there are a lot of people who are very disappointed and say, I want Windows 11, but I can't. I can't do it on my existing hardware. Um, it's the kind of thing Apple does all the time. Microsoft, not usually. You're enjoying this podcast ad-free thanks to the members of the Club Twit. Are you a member yet? Club Twit is a great deal. It helps support all of our podcasts, just $7 a month, but you get some nice benefits. Ad-free versions of all of our shows, audio and video, uh, access to our fabulous Club Twit Discord full of really great people uh, talking about subjects, not just our own shows, but all sorts of subjects, plus a unique opportunity to interact with all our hosts at Club Twit. And then there's the Twit Plus feed with content that doesn't make it to the podcasts. Some of the best stuff happens before and after shows, and all of that will make it to the Twit Plus feed. $7 a month, those are the benefits, but the real benefit is knowing you're really helping us out, keeping our great programming going. And as Club Twit expands, even add new programming and maybe trips to CES and more. Uh, we love doing what we do, and we really appreciate your support. If you'd like to do that, go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thank you so much. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, Vigil, visual, <laughs> virtual reality, visual reality, real reality, 8888, ask Leo is the phone number if you want to know uh, anything about tech. If you want to talk tech, this is the place to do it, 888-827-5536. If you hear something on the show and you want to make a note of it, good news, you don't have to. James DeRuvo, our scribe, writing it all down. You'll find him at uh, and his writings, his scribblings at techguylabs.com. That's the website. Tech Guy, that's me, labs, that's where I work, dot com. Uh, it is uh, free for all. There's no sign up. We invite you to stop by techguylabs.com. Back to the phones we go. Lee on the line from Carbondale, Illinois. Hello, Lee. Thank you, Leo, for taking my call and uh, for your service to the community. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. Uh, I uh, have uh, three issues, uh, two uh, concerning Cloudflare. I need your advice, and uh, one about malware. Uh, Cloudflare, uh, I was hesitant in using them as a DNS uh, uh, server. Uh, I'm using OpenDNS right now, and uh, Google, uh, instead of Frontier, so I don't... Always better to use anything instead of Frontier, whenever <laughs> possible. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> I wanted to use them. They are, I think, at this point, the worst big Internet service provider in the country. Just terrible. Terrible. So you, you don't want, and we talked about this last week, and it's a really interesting, and it's kind of an advanced thing. No, You don't have to worry about this. DNS is the big phone book in the sky where we, when you typed in techguylabs.com, you actually can't just go to techguylabs.com. You need to go to an, a number. 168.1.3.4, whatever that is, that unique number that all computers on the Internet have. They call it the IP address. The phone book's in the sky. They're run by the ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, will translate the name into the number. And, uh, and you need that to do anything on the Internet at all. So the things that do the thing that does that is called the domain name. That's the domain name system DNS, and the thing that does that is a domain name server. Your internet service provider runs one, and in most cases, that's the one you're going to use. It's the default, 
but you don't have to. And there are reasons you might not want to. Uh, in some cases, internet service providers might record every DNS query you do, giving them a list of all the sites you visit. They might sell that to marketers. They might, you know, who knows what they can do with this. Some people don't want to use it. Sometimes their servers are slow. I would bet Frontier does not run the best DNS servers in the business. So you might want something that's faster, maybe a little bit more private. But there's even more you can do if you run the DNS service. You can block bad sites. You can do a, block advertising, do a lot of things. So a lot of people choose to use other services. You use OpenDNS, which for years I recommended. It's a, it's, a, it's a service that not only is a fast DNS provider, but they do things like uh, block stuff. They have uh, fit parental filters. They can do all sorts of great stuff. Cisco bought them a little while ago. Um, and are you thinking of changing because you're dissatisfied with it, or are you just looking at what other choices? Well, I was just wondering about uh, security, if the uh, uh, Cloudflare, uh, Cloudflare was better. And, uh... Cloudflare, I think, is great. Uh, I know the the CTO there, John Graham Cumming. I've known him for years. It's a uh, I've met Matthew Prince, the CEO. It's a very good company. They have a DNS provider one dot one dot one dot one, which yep. is easy to remember, and they do m pretty much the same thing Open DNS does, but they do it for free. Yep. So uh, I do I don't have any hesitation recommending them. They claim to be the fastest uh, DNS server on the earth. Maybe they are. My friend Steve Gibson makes a benchmark uh, tool that you can use for free to, to see if it's that's the... That's what I've used. Okay. And if, and if Cloudflare is the fastest for you, that's at grc.com. It's the GRC benchmark, DNS yeah. benchmark free. Well, actually, the, the open DNS was faster, so that's why I was using that. Okay. There's also... There are many people <laughs> providing now DNS service. There's quad nines. Cloudflare also has added to 1.1.1.1. They have... Uh, more uh, services, better blocking. They have ad blocking and so forth. Yeah. Um, so I think they're a very good choice. I'll tell you what I use, which is a service that I replaced OpenDNS.com with that is similar to all of these. It's NextDNS at NextDNS.io. They call themselves the new firewall for the modern Internet. So it, uh, it does security. It does uh, child protection. It blocks ads. It blocks trackers. Uh, I really like what they offer. It's it's not compl it's free for the first three hundred thousand queries a month, but if you put it on everything as I do, I actually have it running on my router so that everything in the house goes through it, uh, which most people will do if they really care about their DNS provider. Um, it ends up being more than three hundred thousand queries a month, but even then, it's only a buck a month. So and, uh, I uh, have a dot com since nineteen ninety eight. But, uh, wow. Yeah, Wait a minute. You got your dot .com in 98? Yes. You and must have known the internet was going to be something. Absolutely. But uh, I use it basically as a portfolio for my son, uh, and uh, I use it for my own cloud storage, but basically I use it for uh, uh, email. But uh, now uh, when I uh, uh, upload anything and want uh, my family, uh, family or friends to uh, link to it, uh, uh, it, I don't have a HTTPS. Uh, I don't have an SS. Ah, and well, that's up to you to do on your server. That's not something that is done by any, like, your domain provider. Well, that's why I was uh, uh, considering Cloudflare, because they've got a free SSL certificate. Oh, yeah, and that's a different, that's another service that they provide, and absolutely, Thanks, no, no problem recommending that. That's a great service. I use something that's free called Let's Encrypt, very widely used, a little more complicated. You have to run a script on your hosting, uh, on your host and your server that will automatically download a new uh, certificate every three months, because they only last three months. But that's another one to look at. But uh, absolutely, use Cloudflare. No problem with that at all. It's much easier to set up, actually. Yeah, because uh, now when people uh, use their cell phones uh, uh, to use uh, their, uh, like, uh, Android or... You kind of have to have HTTPS. Yeah. yeah. They, can't, they can't access it. Yeah, they get warnings. Yeah, that's going to be get even worse. Yes. So yeah. so do, do, do do that. And Cloudflare also offers DDoS protection. They have a lot of... They're a really yeah. great company. Uh, and the free services they offer are remarkable. Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to know. And, uh, and you're right to be suspicious. When somebody offers you something for free, yeah. 
<laughs> it's like, well, okay, but why? Are they data, uh, data mining? Like, uh, yeah. What used to be considered malware is now what everyone uses as an app called uh, Facebook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Facebook is definitely malware, continues to be malware. I do not recommend anybody use the, Facebook. The old definition for, <laughs> for malware is what the, the new definition for Facebook is. So the reason Cloudflare is free is they, they offer some really powerful solutions for the big boys. Yeah. And the big boys pay a lot of money to use that, things like their DDoS protection and, and so forth. Uh, but in order to do that, they kind of need to know what's going on in the, on, the, on the Internet as a whole. So it's my understanding, the reason they offer these free services is it, is it helps them understand how the Internet is working so that these paid services work better. I like it. We all win. Hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it, Lee. Great to, great to hear from you. Keep calling now that you know the way. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. John is on the line from St. George, Utah. Hello, John. Hey, Leo. I've got a uh, early 2011 MacBook Pro. Nice. Inch. Yep. Uh, which I was uh, surprised to, well, i not so surprised, but I learned on the Internet that Apple has declared it obsolete. But then I learned... It is 10 years old. Yeah. <laughs> all that means that is, awesome all that means is you're not going to be able to install the latest Big Sur operating system on it. That's all. Yeah. That doesn't mean they're not going to provide security updates or anything like that. But 10 years old, it's, it is, it's not, I, I wish they didn't use the word obsolete, but I don't know, out of date maybe would be better. Uh-huh. Well, I've learned that it's possible to, uh, I could do it myself, uh, replace the hard drive with a solid state drive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, increase the RAM from 4 gigabytes to 16. One of the big advantages of those old MacBooks is you could do that. Yeah. But you can't do it on the modern ones. They're all soldered in and glued in, and you, there's no upgrades available at all. And also, I want to upgrade the operating system. Um, you will be limited there. That's 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 what they're really saying is, you know, we're not going to continue to support it with operating system upgrades. You'll you'll get stopped. I'm not sure what where you'll get stopped, but somewhere like Mountain Lion. Yeah, I, I my understanding is it's uh, Sierra or High Sierra. High Sierra, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Some people have with a, some kind of a patch have been able to go to Catalina, I think, but... Uh, I wouldn't do that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to try that. No. But I've anyway, uh, there is a sale going on right now. I think this is the last day uh, of uh, the M1 Mac Mini oh. for five ninety nine. dollars Great price. But I've read some reviews on Amazon. Some people have had horrible experiences. This is the 2020... M1 Mac Mini, I believe. Yeah. And uh, 2021, actually, but okay, yeah. So um, I'm not sure why they're having horrible experiences. That's a great machine. You know, I'm not sure I'd trust all the reviews on Amazon, to be no, it fair. It's like uh, when, you, when you initially start it up and to set it up, you need to have a wired mouse and maybe a wired keyboard. That's not true. Um, I think that's, that's a problem some people may have because they don't understand what they're doing. Um, I'm maybe that's a problem buying it from Amazon. I would buy it from Apple. Uh, but it, but if that's the only place you're going to get the sale, who's the seller on that? Costco. Ah, uh, okay. Well, Costco has good support. Uh, you can use a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard uh, to start up uh, any Macintosh. It's easiest with an Apple mouse and keyboard, obviously. But um. You know, so maybe they had a some oddball Bluetooth keyboard and mouse. Yeah, years ago I got uh, a deal on a Microsoft uh, optical mouse and keyboard, wireless keyboard, and uh, a uh, a monitor. Well, it's, it's really a. It's nice. It is nice 21. to have a wired keyboard and mouse for those times when you know it doesn't see the wireless one on boot. So that's not a bad thing to you know you can get one for ten bucks on Amazon. If it's from Costco, is there a Costco near St. George? Yeah, there is one. So one of the things that's great about Costco is their return policies are they're excellent. So maybe see if the Costco near you has that same deal and get it from them. 
That they, is, that's what the deal I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's not Amazon. Oh, I see. You're reading Amazon reviews. I get it. Yes. Yeah, no, I would, ha you know, look, they're great. If you have any problems, they'll, re they'll take it back. They're actually more generous than Apple is. Even if it's been open and, and used? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I I don't I think you're going to be very happy with that M1. It's going to be massively faster. Uh, you're now kind of as we were talking about earlier, joining the future of Apple. Intel is going to be left in the dust, and Intel Max are going to increasingly not be able to run the latest software. They're not going to run as well. Uh, the the speed, the performance of that thing is going to be fantastic. You don't need to get more than eight gigs of RAM. That's fine if if you want to spend for sixteen, which I did on all my. Uh, I did on all my M1s, but uh, you don't need to. Eight gigs is fine, and I think they they are fabulous systems. There will be, I'm almost certain, Apple never pre-announces, but I'm almost certain there'll be a higher end Mac Mini coming out in the fall, but it will be more expensive. It'll have more ports and more ma memory and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's why I'm wondering if I should take this deal now. I think it's uh, for six bucks, six hundred bucks. That's a that's the least expensive Mac you can get. It's a big upgrade as long as you got a keyboard, mouse, and monitor you can use with it. The monitor is an HDMI monitor. Um, now, will it only run software that's written for that M1 chip, or uh, does no? It there's do so they, yeah. There's a there's a compatibility layer Apple calls Rosetta 2 that runs most Intel stuff. Here's the good news: almost all software developers who are really Mac focused have upgraded. Um, uh, my M1 runs everything I want it to run. The big shift was actually not this, but the shift in Catalina to 32-bit, uh, away from 32-bit to 64-bit software. Old 32-bit programs will not run. So if you have a program that is 32-bit that hasn't been upgraded, then, yeah, you may... You, uh, are you running anything really old? Well... <laughs> 2011 MacBook Pro. Yeah, but but oh. the software that you're running probably has been updated, right? I mean, are you running something that I, is from I 2011? Right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't do anything exotic. I mean, yeah, yeah. I might want to get into some video editing, maybe for yeah. YouTube videos. Yeah, that's fine. Like that. Yeah, it comes with GarageBand. Uh, sorry, that's the music program. It comes with iMovie, which is fantastic. Um, and and of course, Final Cut is uh, is also very very good. I. I can. I don't know what the reviewers didn't like about it. I think you're, they're going to love it. Do you have a wired keyboard and mouse lying around? Yeah, like I said, I got a, a deal on. It's a wireless. It's a Microsoft wireless. Not not, um, not wireless. Wired keyboard. Do you have a wired one? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know if there'd be a problem with a non-Apple Bluetooth on boot up. Once you've started, of course, it'll continue to work. So, if but you can get a cheap, and it's good to have anyway. Wired keyboard and mouse. Hold on, just a second. I gotta take a break. Uh, I think that'd be a good thing to do, just in case. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had to take a break there. Okay. Still here. Um, I have never had a problem. I might think, but I think it's always been with an Apple keyboard and mouse. So. I'm not sure if on it's only on first boot because you have to say, let me introduce you to my keyboard and mouse before the operating system's running. Yeah, uh, but and that's never been a problem with Apple's stuff. I don't know how it works with other Bluetooth. Yeah, well, I'm thinking in terms of that sort of thing, Mac Mini, because I I do have the uh, keyboard and mouse wireless and uh, and a. Uh, uh, it's a TV. I'm going to use as a monitor. Okay, all of that will yeah, work. All of that will work inch. fine once once you get the setup. But I'm cons that review you told me about that said you can, it, it doesn't work with a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse on startup. That, that might be true for a non Apple device. So I'm not sure. That's well, all. there were two, at least two that that said that that seemed to be, and then okay. they, they said they called Apple, and Apple told them yes, that's correct. That okay. when you initially start it up, you need a wired mouse and. But uh, that might be just a glitch with the first model. And no, that's be update. well. If you think about it, you haven't paired the keyboard and mouse yet. You turn on the machine; it's never seen it before. We, again, with an Apple device, they have circuitry designed for that. 
because they ship a lot of their computers with wireless keyboards and mouse mice. It has to work. But it may be the case that on that Microsoft keyboard, it may not work. So if you that sounds like you should probably get a ten. You can get them for ten bucks. A ten dollar wired keyboard and mouse. It's good to have as a backup anyway. Uh huh. Okay. Um, do, do you um, also do you use a VPN or do you recommend a VPN? We have a sponsor, ExpressVPN. Uh, if you're going to use a VPN, it's a great one. Uh, here's the good news: <laughs> if uh, Apple has a very good service that's starting up now, I, for, if you're do you use iCloud at all? Do you have iCloud uh, storage? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Might be worth looking at uh, uh, using iCloud storage because anybody who uses iCloud will get the benefit of this new... Uh, it's not exactly a VPN. It gives you the privacy and security features of a VPN. It doesn't give you the geographic bypass of a VPN. So if you wanted to watch Netflix in the UK, you couldn't use it. But it does everything else a VPN does. In fact, it does it better. It's I'm really impressed with it. This is part of iCloud um, Plus, they're calling it. it and uh, you will get that if you have any iCloud services. I would look at Apple's uh, iCloud service anyway for backup and so forth. Is a certain amount of storage included with that? or Yeah, I think the, the, the free tier is 5 gigabytes. I can't remember what it is. Maybe it's 15. You need to buy at least 200 gigabytes to take advantage of the VPN. Um, Otherwise, which would be, the, by the way, the cheapest way to get a VPN, ExpressVPN is about 7 bucks a month. You only need a VPN if you're worried. Are, is this for at home? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't bother. Or maybe uh, I, I may want to use it on my cell phone. Yeah, I mean, if you're out and about, I think a VPN is a good idea. Um, cell phones are secure. You're not going to take the mini out and about, so I think you I think you probably can do with that. If I use a public Wi-Fi. Hotspot. Yeah, that's when I would use it. Yeah. Um, so would the iCloud or iCloud Plus um, can that be a substitute for iDrive cloud backup? It is iDrive. Oh, oh, iDrive, yes. No, uh, no, it's not the same. You would still want iDrive. <laughs> okay. they're, different, they're different features. iCloud is, if used properly, iCloud is a good backup, but it is not a real backup solution in the way that iDrive is. Have to run, out of time. Leo Laporte, the rock and roll tech guy, 8888, ask Leo the phone number, 888 827-5536. Uh, back to the phones we go. Kevin on the line from San Clemente, California. Hello, Kevin. CQ, 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 WB. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're using this uh, this okay. pre-ham radio technology called a telephone. I don't know if you're familiar with okay. it. You do not okay. need to CQ, but I am W6TWT. Very nice to meet you. WB6HEI. Okay. Um, what my question is, uh, you just got through talking with some people about Facebook and why you don't use Facebook. You know, let me back up. You didn't say why you don't use Facebook. I said it's malware. Uh, I have a, a lot. I Look, use Facebook. It's fine. I am not a fan of how Facebook imposes on your privacy. They collect a huge amount of information about you and are always trying to get more. But to be fair, they're only doing it to sell advertising. It's not like they're you know, making a dossier on you that they're going to send off to a foreign power or anything. It's just for advertising. Uh, I'm not a fan of Mark Zuckerberg's kind of attitude towards that. He seems fairly insensitive to that notion. I'm also uh, not a fan of how Facebook has been used to radicalize people and, unfortunately, to promote conspiracy theories that have not been good for the world. In fact, Facebook uh, was used by dictators in the Philippines and Myanmar. Uh, I, I'm just not a fan. Just not a fan. Okay, so, 
So let me expand that question then. I'm not a user of it, but my wife and my kids use it. Um, when you say they collect a great amount of information, how? excuse my ignorance here, but how do they collect that information? Because your kids and your wife give it to them. <laughs> okay. <Does> your wife... <laughs> so first of all, everything you put on Facebook is Facebook's property immediately. Uh, but also, you know, they encourage you strongly to put their apps on, which is not just Facebook, but Instagram and WhatsApp on your phone. Why? Because the phone then shares location information. You may remember Facebook took out full page ads in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal when Apple said, we're going to have a little toggle when you first install an app that says, do not track me app. Facebook was so incensed by this, they took out full, very expensive full-page ads in major national newspapers saying, this is bad for small businesses. Well, it was bad for Facebook, maybe. It was bad for their information gathering. So they very aggressively gather as much as they possibly can about you. But again, it's just to sell advertising. Uh, I think, you know, most normal... Look, everybody who's listening uses Facebook, including your wife and kids. I don't both... As a, taking a stand, I, you know, my information's online anyway. I'm not worried about that. But but more as a as a statement that I don't want to support them. I don't want to give them money because I don't like how they do business. Um, there aren't really any great alternatives. I mean, people, my wife uses Facebook and Instagram too, and uh, people love it. It's a great way to stay in touch. She's always telling me which members of our family and friends have just gotten married, had a baby, passed away. She knows because she's on Facebook and Instagram. I have no idea. Uh, and in a way, I don't want to know, to be honest with you. I don't miss having Facebook and Instagram. The, other, the main reason I stopped using Facebook is I noticed I would be in a bad mood afterwards. That it, it, it didn't feel good for my mental health. Uh, and that's just a personal thing. But I also, for political reasons, I don't think I want to support Facebook. So if the app is on the phone, remove it. Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely not put it on the phone because now you're giving them a lot more information. Your phone is the most sophisticated tracking device ever invented. You know, we get all upset that <laughs> if the, if the uh, local police came and put a GPS tracker on your car, you might get a little upset about that. They don't have to. You're carrying the best GPS tracker in the world with you all the time. Oh, and by the way, it has a camera and microphone on it. It is. <laughs> it's the first. Just okay. put, let's put it this way. It's the f when Jason Bourne picks you up <laughs> to get you away from the bad guys. What's the first thing he does? He takes your phone, breaks it in half, throws it out the window. I'm going to have to watch those again. <laughs> I rest my case. Hey, it's, it's nice. 70, 73. 73. It's nice to talk to you. Have a great day. Bye -bye. <laughs> uh, I, I am not particularly paranoid about uh, privacy, honestly. Uh, as I said, when you're you know on the air every day of your life for the last 45 years, there's not a lot of secrets. Um, it's not that I'm trying to protect my privacy. I certainly understand if people are. It's more that I just don't like how invasive Facebook is. I don't like how they've run Facebook. It's been used by dictatorships to, f to further their dictatorships, and Facebook doesn't seem to care. It's, it's, uh, but, but I understand people also want to stay in touch with family and friends, and there's a real benefit to Facebook that way. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing communication tool. And so if you find real value in it, just it's important to understand what you're trading for that value. And if you're willing to do that, then by all means, use Facebook. I, I'm not telling people not to use it. I don't. I don't. Don on the line from Los Angeles. Hello, Don. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Perplexed. Oh, no. Um, I, yeah, right. I recently uh, decided to try to um, revitalize or kind of restore function in a um, desktop that I have. So I took on putting in a power supply. And once I got over the confusion, thanks to YouTube, about the wires oh, good. Uh, that come with them, yes. uh, everything seemed fine. So I, I booted it up, and it didn't seem to be able to find the hard drive, which I had taken out of it and was using it in a hard drive dock uh, for the last six months. Um, and so I kind of don't know how I found 
the path to that, but managed to reconnect it. And started- sounds like you got quite a Rube Goldberg contraption on your hands here. <laughs> no, it, I put it back the way it was. Oh, good. Um, um, but the thing is, when I got it put back together, the only thing that I've noticed is I my start menu doesn't work for not number one, and for number two, actually I can right click it and start it. And number two is it, this is I don't maybe completely this connected and the point of the call is that I can't download PDFs and attachments from my Gmail account because it opens up and says it's somehow uh, um, Google work or something like that. So I, I'm very perplexed because all I did was, you know, a very simple, you know, like re- replace the power tank, stick the hard drive that was in it before back in and it should have, should have worked seamlessly. And now I'm a little confused. Um, yeah, that is odd. It might be worth a reinstall of Windows. Uh, Windows 10? Yeah. Yeah, so Windows 10 has a refresh command. There's a number of different levels of recovery for Windows 10, all the way from just refresh files to delete everything and start over. It sounds right. like the start menu not working is bizarre. It sounds like there might be some hard drive permissions errors, or you may even have some hard drive I errors. Think that- no, I no, I think that's exactly right because when I tried to open the hard drive after putting it back in, it says you don't have permission for this drive. Yeah. So I clicked on the on the thing that says open and it just said continue. Yeah. Once I clicked open continue, this I'm remembering uh, the the way I noodled to it. I managed to find my way through user and so on and so forth to me, right? And then I opened it. So it's open. Right, but it's, <laughs> it's not open properly. Access, what I would, you know, if, exactly if, right, if, yeah. if you, one of the, one possibility is you still got that ex, the external hard drive enclosure. Maybe, maybe back up your data off this thing to the hard drive, wipe the drive, and reinstall Windows Clean. I think it would fix all of the problems. No, yeah. Well, I'm trying to avoid that. If you don't want to do it, then go into the... <laughs> pre- that's fine. Press the Windows key, type recovery, look at the recovery options. There are recovery options that will f- refresh Windows without deleting your data or your account. And try that. That that may kind of reclaim the things you no longer have access to. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's Disco Dick D. Bartolo. Come on down. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Dick D. Bartolo, Mads, maddest writer. A disco fiend, so we always play disco music for him. And he is our permanent installation of our gizmo <laughs> wizard. Every week he joins us to talk about a gizmo or a gadget. Are you wearing your gizmo? I am wearing one of them. I have now invested in three of them, <laughs> but, but only because I'm I'm trying to keep up on the latest. They are neck fans. Wait a minute. And, Wait a minute. You told yeah. me to buy a neck fan some time ago, and I did. Yes, that's your problem. That was some time ago. Oh, this is the Wait, new this neck is, fan. <laughs> this is the bladeless neck fan. Oh, that one has blades. Believe me, you could shave oh. with my neck fan. Oh, okay, okay. Well, the 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 fans are in here where you can't see them. Oh, they're and internal. Then it blows air up through. This one has, I think, a hundred and four little louvers, and it's USB C. <laughs> oh, it's the hundred four louver neck fan. I I, I know uh-huh. that there is a heat wave on because I bought these two weeks ago. They've gone up ten dollars. It's surge into- pricing. Yes. Absolutely. And yes. one of them is not even available. One of them is now, I paid 24 it's $40. Whoa. So I found another one that, there's a smaller one. Are you one. sure that's a neck fan? What the hell is, <laughs> it's huge. It's, it looks like the no, St. Louis the, Arch. Well, yeah, well, that's because it's too close to the camera. If I oh, move okay. it back. Oh, yeah, yeah, now it looks like a normal no. neck fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so the um, idea is this keeps you cool by blowing air in your face. Uh, yes, but blowing <laughs> air more around you. The other fans you aimed directly yeah, at. Yeah, so you. the one I got, so, I wish I had known you were going to do this. I would have brought it. It goes around your neck, but then the fans are, are in a... It's two actual fans. Yeah, two they're, little, they're like, little fans, and you can point them at your face. So the, 
the <laughs> the fans blowing in your face. They're not. It's not very comfortable. It was more of a kind of a. Uh, gimmick, I would say, than anything else. Yeah, exactly. This does well, not this, look this... like anything too weird. You could just be wearing a little collar around your horse. Yeah, it, om it, it almost looks like you would be walking down the street wearing a white towel because you're sweating. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, but so it doesn't blow on you. It blows up up above you. It it it, it blows straight up. But the louvers are more toward the front. So the more you bend it around, uh -huh. the more... And, and I was thinking, since we have a microphone here, people are always saying, well, how loud is it? Let's hear it. So, okay. This is low. That's, That's not, not bad, bad, right? No. Uh, medium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Let's hear high. People are going to know you're coming. You sound like the... <laughs> You sound like well, RoboCop. Here, he, here, he's on his way. I, but you know what? <laughs> Does it bother in, you? In the, ho in, in the house, you hear it. But you walk out on a New York City street, you hear it. You don't hear this at all. You, there are no. so many other no, noises. Honk, honk, honk. Get out of my way. I'm walking here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah. Well, this has New York City sounds if you want to go to the fourth <laughs> point. Oh. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that th I use that to go to sleep at night. When I'm <laughs> when I'm in Vegas, I pl I, I use that sound. Uh, we so city can kids cannot sleep in all the quiet of Vegas. It's <laughs> exactly. Too quiet. E so exactly. This one is called the fig roll. Fig roll. Yes. Can you believe it? The fig roll, <laughs> and then the other one is the jizz you life. Yes. <laughs> okay. That one hasn't arrived yet. The one I bought is discontinued, but the Jiju Life looks exactly the same, has pretty much the same specs. So I suspect it is the same device from the same and, Chinese company. And they're both battery powered, so you charge them up. How they're long? Both how long does the does the fig roll go? Four to eight hours, depending on if you're using low, medium, or high. Yeah. The new the new one that I just ordered. The Jiju Life has a 4,000 milliamp battery. The others have a 2,400 milliamp. They claim 4 to 12 hours. Again, totally rechargeable. And if you don't mind green, green is still $26. Black <laughs> is no, like nobody 35 wants the green. But the one you have is white and really stands out. So you might yeah, want exactly. the subtler tones. Yeah. Of if you're an Apple person, this is yes. It looks like it'll match your AirPods perfectly. Yeah, exactly. In fact, somebody will exactly. just think you have a big Apple AirPod around your neck. There you go. Is that the there new Apple AirPod Pro Curve? Yeah, and feel the air. This is the Air <laughs> Pro with real air. See, forget Jisoo Life. They should have named it like the Air Pod thing around your neck. Yeah, neck pod. Air Pod blower. It's yeah. the air, I should say that it's the uh, Apple Air Pod blower. It's the Air like blower. Have you seen these? For, They're it's incredible. Two hundred dollars, but I could sell you this one for a hundred. Yeah, Apple would sell it to you for four hundred if they could. Yeah, exactly, me. exactly. So all of these gadgets are available on Dick's website, gizwiz.biz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z.B-I-Z. -I -I He's got links to the Amazon uh, listing, so it makes it very easy to go right there. He's also got pictures in the description and so forth. If it's hot, if it's getting hot in here, put on your fig roll yeah, neck you're, fan. You're, you're in that wave uh, that he wave. No, we're not. Right? We're not oh, here. Oh, you're in, not? Well, oh. Seattle is going to be 105 this week. I yes. That's crazy. They're just not prepared for that. They need the, the yeah. you know, they don't have the snow plows. They don't have the salt. They don't have any of that well, I stuff. I don't think they need. <laughs> <laughs> They're just not ready for weather. Yeah. If it's a typical city, they would have the snow plows and the salt. They just wouldn't have anything to fix. No air, air conditioning. conditioning. <laughs> yeah, no, no air conditioning. Well, they need the fig roll neck pod. That's what they there need. There you go. There you go. Dick is at gizwiz.biz. When you're there, play the what the heck is it contest, a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. Yeah, By the way, four days. I'm holding in my hand. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Autographed to me personally, so you can't have it. The, uh, the Mad for August, which uh, features King Kong on the front being gagged by Godzilla or gagged by Gagzilla. Uh, Dix has a lot of pages in this one because he wrote a lot of the uh, parodies of the Godzilla movies. Uh, you'll find this 
in your mailbox if you're one of the people who correctly identify a close-up picture of a gizmo or a gadget. Uh, six Mads autographed by Dick for the uh, best for the correct answer. And correct. I, yep. I think there's more at twelve for the best clever answer that's wrong. Anyway, Perfect. that's a nice prize. And yes, only a few more days. It's the end of the month. You may want to do this right now. Go to gizwiz.biz. Don't forget, you can also see his podcast. That if you like this crappy gadget, you'll <laughs> love his show. Just full of them. Gizwiz. TV. He specializes in the. Uh... Oh, look! There's even a fold in in this one. Yes, that is the one feature that they have continued with a new artist. Johnny Sampson did this one. Yeah, what? and it was very sweet because he sent Al Jaffe something, and Al Jaffe said, "Oh, this is wonderful. You should call Mad. I think you should take over when I retire." No kidding! Wow! And so Al has finally. At the age of 100, 100. retired, and uh, Johnny gets it. How old is Johnny? Uh, you know, I don't know. I just know him by name. <laughs> a lot of these guys are getting on. So uh, Yes, I know. I, a, uh, <laughs> the usual gang of idiots is becoming yeah, but very, they, very small. It shows, though, that you will, if you, uh, if you have a good sense of humor, you will live a long life because they, they are all just... Keep, they just keep on going. So this no, one, this fold-in is, is... That is true. And I just, I folded it in. What piece of technology are people eager to throw in the trash? It's got a municipal dump and an incinerator. People are going in there. And when you fold it in, which means you fold this, this together with this, what do you get? The picture is... I don't know what. A uh, iPhone? A picture? It's a camera. Is, is that the Zoom logo? What, oh, it's that? Zoom. Maybe it's Zoom. <laughs> See, I didn't use Zoom enough. Yes, it's Zoom. Oh, oh, oh that's okay. the per that's the you got you nailed it. It is. It's the Zoom. And that's logo. from three thousand miles away. Can you? <laughs> these glasses are great. Thank you, Dicky D. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.